see a Vanny over there, so full of himself now. He used to work in the post office. I introduced him to the proper financing, and now he owns the mines. Yes, making a fortune. Keeps the miners in line. Good business. You might wonder why I'm not in it myself. I don't need to own the mines, Jonathan. Do you know why? Because I own the man who owns the mines. All he has, I have. Same with the supermarkets, the TV station, locomotive plant. I don't need a podcast because I own the men who do. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really remember that. I don't remember that happening either. <laughs> now, here's why I, I chose that. I was going to say that. I watched the movie maybe 16 hours ago, and I don't <laughs> I don't really, remember. I don't, I don't remember that. For that long. I don't remember that. That's the longest one. I just want to quickly read through the other quotes on the page because they're not many. I was excited to do a Chris Klein impression. There are no Chris Klein quotes on this page. He's too quotable. The first quote is attributed to Chinese sports announcer. Yeah. Yeah. And the line is, it's simple. About as simple as using a name brand condom. Do you not remember that line? I do remember that one. I remember okay. that. Next quote, English sports announcer. And the other rules, well, the other rules are Russian and complicated. Pa Paul Heyman. They, that they, they, one the I great remember. Paul Heyman. Great yes. Paul Heyman. Yeah. Uh, there's the long John Renault monologue I just did. Yeah. Then... The next quote is English sports announcer, rollerball. Well, that's that I remember in the movie, they, and, them yelling that. And then there's an exchange between John Renault and LL Cool J that is, uh, Ridley, my man, how are you? And then LL Cool J says, I feel like Freddy Krueger. Don't remember. Yeah, that. I don't I remember that either. That. Did he get I remember burned? it, but I didn't understand it. Or did he get, you know, uh, was he subjected to mob justice? Well, as the great Freddy Krueger was. I'm sorry, Freddy Krueger, yeah, yeah. victim of the woke mind virus, <laughs> right. the the radical these left. Pu these public school parents think they can just be judge, jury, and executioner just because he killed their children. <laughs> <laughs> they think they can throw him in a furnace. There should be like a wicked style reimagining of the <laughs> Freddy, Freddy, was good. Freddy was not so bad, actually. I feel like that was the take they tried to have on the Jackie or Haley movie that was, were they wrong? There was definitely that movie tried to do the thing of which the original movie has of like, are they being punished for killing him wrong. outside of the law? Right. 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 I always love or how those movies they were like, of his personal he life. killed 15 kids, but someone forgot to fucking file a piece of paper. So he yes. just walked free. He walked free. The only other quote on the page is uh, Jean Reno's long uh, no, uh, let's, let's just let's rant. Wrap it up. I'm not going to read it. The, uh, the rant about being on Channel 109, oh, yeah. which I do yeah, remember. That was a quality moment. That's a little fun. I will kill you myself. I will disappear your whole family. Look, he's doing something. He is. Now, I don't know if you found this, not to jump ahead, but in the dossier that JJ put together, there is a quote from John McTiernan promoting this movie who said, I think he's the best villain I've ever had in one of my movies. The director of Die Hard and, and Predator. Predator. <laughs> and basic. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, like Medicine Man is a better villain than this movie. A man, yeah, well, the disease, cancer. Cancer. The ultimate villain. A man whose third best villain is Sean Connery in Hunt for Red October. Even if says you, that he okay. thinks Jean Reno is beating Hans Gruber, Predator. <laughs> the Predator. Let's call Connery a not in. Connery's sort of a hero. Sure, a you still got Jeremy Irons or whatever, Simon right? Gruber. Yeah, exactly. Like you still have like very good B tier villains. I would even say Last Action Hero has two good villains in it. That's not a problem of that movie. Both Ripper and uh, fucking uh, Charles Dance are Dance great. If John Reno went up against the Predator, yeah, he would win. He would. He win. has the resources. He controls. He owns the guy yeah. who owns exactly. the Predator. Business acumen. He would have no problem taking down the Predator. No, you're right. Well, I think it's like John Renault is really easy to defeat. Just don't move to Central Asia and sign a deal with him. Then he really can't mess with this you. This is the problem. <laughs> the, the one way he'll get you is he lures you to Rollerball. Right. It's, in rever in fucking it's reverse vampire rules. Jean Renault has to invite is you. allowed to murder you as long as you <laughs> accept his invitation to come to Kazakhstan. <laughs> this is another thing about this movie. So this film's obviously shot in 2000, supposed to be released in 2001, comes Ooh, out in I 2002. Didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. We'll get into all this, but John McTiernan says, I need the film to take place in a country that no one's ever heard of. So I picked Kazakhstan, a country that only four years later will be forever tied in comedy to one character, like a, a country that now most people think is fake, but associate exclusively with. So you can't watch this movie and not think like Van Ice over and over and over again every time Kazakhstan comes up. They, they mostly say Central Asia. 
They try not to say Kazakhstan. Yeah, too I didn't much. even clock that. I, they show I, you a map. And most I of these characters don't Russia, even have wives. Basically. Oh, I have a big chick. King in the castle. John Reno says that at one point. <laughs> My right? solitary social life. Griffin, what's this podcast? This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It's a podcast about filmography. What is happening? The most dangerous sport in the world. Oh, Podcasting okay. about filmography. I see. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they go to the rollerball, baby. Absolutely. This miniseries is called. It's called Pod Hard with a Venge Cast. That's right. And it's discussing the films of John McTiernan. Now, look. The milk has been left out. And has spoiled at We've this point. We've talked about some bounces in our day. This is the only film that bounced someone straight to federal prison. And I want to say right up front, it's obviously a big discussion point with this movie. It's a real reason we wanted to do McTiernan for so long is it's arguably one of the greatest falls from grace. Even, even if not for incarceration, the drop off on the career is so severe. But I will say, having never seen this movie before last night and knowing that this film eventually leads to him serving time, I don't think it was worth it. You don't think so? This is my stance. I think if you're going to go to jail for a movie, which I wouldn't recommend, I would not recommend, this is not the movie but, that is worth. But the question is, is this the version that he was fighting for? Well, we can dig into This is what we it. need to dig into. No. I, I mean, think no. No, no one I was think, fighting for this. I think he ends up in jail indirectly because of him being so terrified by how this movie turned out, right? I mean, the, the whole backbone of the story is he is so convinced that there was a conspiracy to ruin this movie that leads to him being behind bars. I don't think there's any version of this movie that is worth staking your freedom no, this on. This movie is kneecapped from the beginning. Yes. From the time you cast its leads, no offense to them. This is what's crazy. They absolutely fucked with his movie, but also in the quotes that JJ has pulled up, the four worst decisions in this movie were all seemingly made by John McTiernan of his own volition. And he explains why. And you're like, that is the worst idea. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it's it. It's also never worth going to jail. This is my major take. I want to say it's an overriding take. First of all, let's uh, abolish all prisons. Okay, anyway, Griffin, Griffin, <laughs> can, can we just, can we just Secondly, introduce our guest? <laughs> abolish Rollerball. Now bring uh, Rollerball back. I'm Actually, movie. I'm interested in I'm seeing it. I think there's a Rollerball I'm supposed to, to think done. Rollerball's the hero of this film. Rollerball, Rollerball is problematic. And this movie is presenting it to me like it's a good, moral, decent sport. I think Rollerball is empowering. Okay, I like this too. We'll talk about it. There's a version of Rollerball I'm ready to root for. I'm not sure it's this version of Rollerball, the, though. The sport or the movie? The sport. The okay. movie. Well, this movie I'm not rooting for. Our guest today, Return to the Show. What, what, I'm going to say it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. I think one of our finest working character actors. I think you have, in the last couple of years, elevated to being like one of the ultimate. People are thrilled whenever you show up in anything. I mean, I agree. I'll, hey, I'll take it. You should take it all the way to the bank. I mean, your recent character work on Hollywood Handbook. <laughs> well, this is the main. Credit. I, I mean, sexy outst mummy. <laughs> Outstanding performance. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, my my most well liked. This work. is the second thing I was gonna say. I feel like you've <laughs> people stop you in the street. <laughs> hey, you like, sexy mummy. <laughs> I feel like you've elevated to like the top tier of podcast guests. I feel like you're one of the guys who's like a, a Paul F. Tompkins. High tide guest. Well, I'll say it again. That stops today. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> you're gonna grind this show to a yeah. halt. Oh, big time. What I, I I have heard from so many people over the last year, specifically calling out how much they love the yesterday episode. It is like seemingly the most well liked episode we've had in a while. And I messaged you and said like overdue to have you on again. Uh, I here's the, here's the exact text exchange. I said, we got to have you on again if you want to do a McTiernan. Cannot tell you how many people, how often people spotlight the Yesterday app as their favorite. And then your response is, I do think I had Rollerball on DVD, possibly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm now confident I did. You did. Um, but yes. like, did you get it? Because like someone put out a cardboard box of garbage and it no. was in there. So okay. <laughs> so... so Here's my here's my Zach here's Carey. my Great history Zach Carey, returning to the show Zach. with Rollerball. Hi, and I didn't when you mentioned McTiernan, and I was like, well, I don't want to do like Die Hard. That's too like it's uh, that's such a 
You're perfect smart. movie. You, you know, said I like, love almost all of Kiernan's movies. And it's right, true. Sure. I love his movies. And I do remember, how, I don't remember, if, it was probably DVD because we were kind of post VHS for the most part this at this point. This is a peak DVD movie. So um, I'll be honest, it was in that era of my life where I was fooled by the marketing of this is the unrated version of a film. Zach, it's it that is important with this yes. movie. I was a, I was a, yes. probably a freshman in high school. Okay. Sure. So I was like, hey, you know, I hadn't seen the movie, but any chance to get like more violence or yeah. more nudity, I was like, I gotta at least check it out. And it probably took me uh, you know, $150 worth of my money to realize that it's always basically the same movie and like there's maybe 30 seconds more of footage, but... In most cases, yes. Yeah, where, yeah, that's actually a good question. Where are the real unrated editions where it was a thing versus like the later gimmick of like, yeah, throwing one like well, the, random The big scene. thing they started doing was R-rated, already raunchy comedies being released on DVD with the unrated and out of control, <laughs> yes. which very quickly it became clear these are not scenes that were cut for extremity of content. This is... They shot a couple extra scenes specifically for the DVD. It became such a part of the business model. Where someone like, you know, comes on a muffin or whatever. <laughs> right. And they're like, what? Van Wilder is out of control. It would feel like they've literally forced scenes into the development right. process only for the DVD later. And oftentimes they wouldn't actually, this is another trick they would do. You'd be like, these added scenes aren't dirtier than what made the R-rated cut. And they went, yeah, but we didn't resubmit the new cut to the <laughs> MPA. Right, right. It is not rated. Exactly. Right. That was always their argument. <laughs> the only difference in this cut is a couple alt takes of the same dialogue. Yeah, but we didn't send it to get rated. It is unrated and out of control. Rollerball is a movie, though, where this is like one of the things that McTiernan fought over. Is like, this is designed as a hard R. We'll yes. dig into all of this. It's sort of neutered upon release. And then there's this last minute, like way too late attempt to salvage it by being like, we're putting the extreme shit back on the DVD. That having been said, I dug deep onto the internet last night. I was going through a lot of corners and there was a, a detailed testimony I read from someone who went to one of the early R-rated test screenings. And he was like, what I saw was much more extreme than what is ultimately on the R-rated DVD Yeah, cut. at the end of the day, they just put in some boobs and what a couple like bloody hits yeah. maybe that's it right like but less boobs than there were originally possibly is, is so i boobs. don't know what version i even watched yesterday i watched it on tubi okay so is that the unrated version or is that the theatrical version i watched it on itunes what seems to be on itunes is the only option is now what was on the unrated okay. dvd yeah i believe you probably also the, saw the, the big way to tell that's mostly what's around these days the right. locker room scene yes if yeah. you see boobs there was nudity it's yes. the r-rated version the and when it was released in theaters they cgi tank tops onto them oh my god it is one of those movies where they like painted black <laughs> tank eyes tops. Shut situation yes yes so that's the one clear tell of which version you're watching i think the theatrical version basically is no longer in circulation I, I do, like, who would want it? I uh, yes. mean, I'm going to be honest. I would love to see it. Well, uh, I'm sure you could find it somewhere. At the very least, you could buy a DVD. My rental is, I have another 47 hours on it. <laughs> it also was skipping, kind of, in moments. Like, it was. this is poorly edited, right? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking what do you about? Mean? What do you mean? Okay, sorry. No, there, sorry. There are no technical sorry. meddling. This is this is wet off of McTiernan's own <laughs> editing table. It's a pure cut. Okay. <laughs> okay. A consistent vision. Um, I, I try to, you know, look, I don't want to fall into <laughs> I don't want to fall into hyperbole with every movie we covered on the show. This might be the most incoherent film we've ever discussed. It's I don't know if it's the worst. It's look, I'll say it's not incoherent in that like it follows the formula of films that are coherent. Yes. Guy takes job, is sports, turns out to be bad and rigged, yeah. rebels. Yes. Okay? Like, that happens in the film. Agreed. Right? But, that is the plot of the film. But the only way you understand <laughs> that that's what's happening in the film is, is by having seen other films. And you're relating <laughs> right. and you're like, I guess this must be them attempting to do that kind of scene. It only works by association of more functional like, movies. Have you seen the original Rollerball with James No, Cohen? I haven't. So in that film, which I have seen, which yeah. is, in my opinion, not a masterpiece, but is both a functional film and a fairly influential one in its and, way. And is 
on paper, the exact perfect kind of movie to remake 100%. 30 years later, yeah. 25 years later, where you're like, this is a movie with incredible concept, right. some incredible iconography. It, a it doesn't bit. totally nail the execution. Right. But in the original movie, yes. the sport of rollerball makes sense. It is. And and by the way, those sequences are thrilling They're to watch. They're really cool. It's way simpler. There's no like ramp and tunnel. No. There's no, none of that like business. It's just like a bicycle track. It's just a, a ring. A lot of simple master shots it's where you can- It's basically roller derby with motorcycles. <laughs> the game like, is legible. You it's know. roller derby with motorcycles and like bocce ball. Yeah, right? you throw a ball at a thing. I mean, like in right. roller derby, there's no ball, but like it's the same basic concept. You're just trying to knock right. people it's over. Like jousting you know? and roller. Yeah. It's like a combination of all stuff, but you're like, I get it. You watch it immediately. This movie has a sequence in which Paul Heyman is explaining the rules to you in detail accompanied by a CGI graphic to, meaning to illustrate the rules of the game and it doesn't make sense as they're taking the time wait, wait, to stop and show okay, it. Exactly, I want to say, exactly. go ahead, please. Yes. I really liked that part <laughs> and I liked that it didn't I, make any sense. I think <laughs> yes, it's maybe the best yeah. scene in the movie. I don't say that. <laughs> as I was watching, I was taking notes and I was marking time codes as to when I thought this was still an incredible, brilliant movie. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I got to about 38 minutes in before yeah. it started to show cracks for me. A couple, um, a couple of hairline fractures. Yeah. But that the, the quote we talked about where he says the rest of the rules are in Russian and they're complicated. We're not going to into it. Yeah. That's all I needed to hear. Cause then I need, then I know I don't need to worry about what the rules I, are. I, I think they I may like have made a mistake in even trying to give us any rules. I so. agree. Because what he does, he's like, all right, here are the rules. Then he says 80 rules. Yeah. And then he's like, the rest of the rules. I'm like, how can there be more rules? I right, believe buddy. he also does <laughs> double back. He's like, okay, you got to do two laps. <laughs> right. And then he's like, but first. <laughs> yes, he does do that. He's like, but first you got to go through the <laughs> tunnel. Through the fucking tunnel. <laughs> Why are yeah. these rules out of order? Which we only man. see the tunnel happen one time, I think in the entire film. Yeah. Do it right away, and then they never talk yeah. about the tunnel yeah. again. And he makes it sound like, and it is hard to get to the tunnel. Chris Klein goes into that tunnel, he walks Easy. into that tunnel. Yeah. Like, it's the easiest shit in the world. That makes it feel to me like this is a real sport, and that someone was like, those are the rules. We have to include the tunnel, because all the fans of real rollerball the will be upset right. if, if our movie doesn't <laughs> the make fans yeah, are yeah, like, exactly. where's the, there's no tunnel in the original. But I feel like this is the point you were trying to make. The cold open of the original rollerball film is just a game happening happening that you watch for basically 15 minutes yeah. uninterrupted where they do not stop to explain the rules to you and you're like I think I get this yeah. it is all just communicated through action right and you're like I think I get this and also this is really exciting to watch and this movie like does not drop you dead into the middle of it it tries to ease you into it and is infinitely more confusing I love being explained the rules of something fictional David loves rules I love fictional sports when I get like an NBA 2K game, like one of those games, I don't play basketball on it. I immediately go to like create league. And then I'm like, all right, we're moving the Rockets to fucking Omaha. Like I just start messing with you it as much as I can. Wife. The new tutorial just <laughs> arrived in the mail. Tutorial? I mean, that's what I call NBA. <laughs> right. <laughs> like... I am all in if this guy is like, okay, this is the Uzbekistan Rough Riders. You know, yes. they have a clown, a devil, a chain guy. I'm like, yes, that's what I want. Instead, it's just like he starts explaining things 50 times and cuts himself off in the middle being like, I, I don't know, man. Don't worry about it, okay? Like, it's... They don't even have the guts to really tell us how rolling well, They works. know their audience, and their audience is not you. They're like dum dums who are like have an attention span that will last 15 seconds. I think you need to see it as they do have the guts to not explain it. Sure. It's because like the audience is smart. They can if figure you it ask out me, this movie, <laughs> this movie is a direct spiritual precursor to Fury Road. Wow. Um, hey, essentially lays the groundwork. In that, for, like, motorcycles aren't where they should be. I mean, like that yeah, kind and of there, vibe. And there's like, like some shredding guitar at moments where you right, weren't expecting absolutely. it. There's like a guy carrying a little puppet around, you know? <laughs> like, there's just a lot going it on. It is true that it's on. like new metal yes, Fury yes. Road. Like it's like, Slip what if Knot Fury Road had come out? The Slip Knot is in the film. is in the Pink. movie. Well, Slip Did you see herself. Pink in the movie? Yes. They must, yes. Yeah. They yeah. must have right away been like, if Slip Knot don't sign on, cancel the film. Like yes. they, they are the first phone call we yes. make executive consultants. I remember Griffin. So I was 16 when this came out. I was about to, I was 15. Yeah, I was 13. And yeah, this was like, it was like John McTiernan is remaking Rollerball with Chris Klein. And I was like, those first two things sound good to me. 
And I, I probably wasn't anti Chris Klein at this point. No, I don't know I if I was like I think crazy we need to place ourselves in that day, which is at that moment, Chris Klein had a very good comedy career. He had done Election and two American Pie movies. Yes. And that's basically like a two out of three ain't bad situation. Right. And you're right? like, it's not like, but who walks out of American Pie being like, you know who's fucking splitting my sides was that Klein fella. I agree. But he's great in election. Yes. And I, look, this is not a totally fair comparison, but you're like, no one thought Bradley Cooper was going to go from the hangover to American Sniper. You could see them just being yeah. like, this guy undeniably looks like a leading man. He can hold the camera. He's given three good comedy performances. Maybe this guy can move lateral. It wasn't until they no, tried it. No, he's a face. He's, yeah, he's like a, yeah. A it guy wasn't you until could they tried Superman. it that it became so apparent. No, he is good at playing one thing and one thing He only. can play like a hayseed, like a hot hick. He can yeah. play affable doofus. Yeah. This was like his first pivot away from... Yes. His first action gotcha. film. Right. He did We Were Soldiers in the same year where he's one of the, you know, soldiers. Right. Not, not like a lead character. Which is like there. his first drama. I mean, the, right. 202 is drama. him trying to step out of teen comedy, high school comedy for the first time. And face planting, basically. Yeah, because then after that, who is he in Just Friends? Is he's he like really good in Just Friends. Is he, is he David, really he good is, in it? I feel the need to defend this because... Because I, I haven't seen Just Friends, or if I have, I don't remember. No, Just Friends, you're like, right. It's the Ryan Reynolds movie. I've, he I plays the... Ryan Reynolds is so caught up in not seeming like the sensitive, friend-zoned guy he was in high school and trying to be an aloof asshole to Amy Smart. And Chris Klein plays the super emotional sweetie pie guy that she starts falling for who Ryan Reynolds hates. And he plays like the parody of uh, a soft boy. Um, right. I think okay. he's good in it. It sounds I, like he's something he'd be good at. Right. I'm like right. American Pie won election, just friends. I'm like, those are three perfectly cast Chris Klein uses. Have you seen... Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun, Chun, Chun Li. I have not. Is is he in that? So he plays. Have you have you played Street Fighter games? Yeah, you're yeah, familiar. Yeah. So he, you know, that game is that movie is like all right. It's this be less about street fighting and more about like cops trying to bust up like a ninja ring. Okay. Um, and Kristen Kreik. Everyone wants. Everyone's complaining about Street Fighter is that it's too colorful and fun. Right. What if we ground this in hard reality and oh no one really fights? So Kristen Kreik. Uh, Lana Lang herself plays Chun Li as like a sort of like undercover spy trying to okay. figure uh, out the uh, shady dealings of M. Bison, who's like a businessman. Uh -huh. And uh, Chris Klein plays Charlie, the Street Fighter character Charlie, um, as a cop, like an Interpol agent. And it is, I think, universally agreed to be the worst performance ever given in film. <laughs> right? Is. And it, there was a it, viral it, video yes. that went around that just is a supercut of every line he speaks in the film. And it's it's devastating to watch. It's so I, tough. I got to check it out. Because it's just him being like, well, I guess this, this is a case for us. Like, it's like stuff like that where you're like, no, no, they surely, like, this isn't from the film, right? Like, have you seen it? The supercut? No. Have you seen Chun -Li, uh, Street Fighter The Legend of Chun Li? Would we watch it, Griff, if we did Street Fighter as a Patreon commentary Absolutely. series? But we have to wait for there to be a third one. I have referred to this line many times over the course of the show, and I want to properly credit and read it properly, because watching Rollerball, I was like, I need to get this line dead to rights correct and give it proper credit. Alonzo Duralde, writing a review for the Today Show at the time, on Today Show's website, it didn't even air, has the line... I can't remember the last time I watched an actor fail to walk into a room convincingly, but Klein does it. Look for a YouTube montage of his Street Fighter performance to pop up any day now, which is what happened. But I just think about that all the time. Last time I watched an actor fail to walk into a room convincingly. Now, I will say his Street Fighter performance feels like a years later overcorrection for a feeling that he wasn't tough enough in Rollerball. Mm. Right? Like... It feels like he's like, fuck, I seemed a little too corn-fed and rollerball. I need a chip on my shoulder. I'm going like full Clint Eastwood. And that movie is him, slick back hair, leather jacket, being like, give me the beat. Sounds like bison's behind this. It's like, you're, what is this? He's, he's Lucas Lee from Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. That's what he's doing the whole time. Whereas, you're right, in this, he barely like registers as a guy. No, it is, this is the thing. Street Fighter is such a big swing that I think became such a black mark on his career. And it was like that followed by the Mamma Mia audition video leaking out turned him into just like definitive punchline. 
this drew like I don't think he did anything wrong. Uh, he, uh, he's not great. I think he was horribly cast. It is astonishing how little he registers as the lead character. There's also of the movie. not much to the character. That's what Jonathan. I'm saying. Yeah. Right. You know. Remember at the end when they're like, and now the most famous rollerball player, Jonathan. Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah. Well, well let's He's, properly credit his full name. Why is he called like Ripcord or something? You know, why did he give him a name? Jonathan E. I mean, Jonathan Cross, of course, oh, is the sure. character's name. Um, but like if you're doing pro wrestling, which is what they're doing, yeah. why isn't he called like fucking Stars and Stripes or whatever? Yeah. His, his character also is like not really coherent to me in that <laughs> oh no he, he's a he's a man who he's a man who was almost like NHL yes. level hockey player right. but who is also into like X game style right. into like, like street luge right <laughs> which this, to me it's like if you're a hockey player you start so young and you dedicate you know like and you're from like Saskatchewan right and you like skate on a pond but he would like also had triple X <laughs> like yes but you gotta go this full triple X before triple X which is wild because it basically has the same opening but yes, yes. It, it, it is wild and it isn't like it's this those movies are tapped into what they sense in the atmosphere. Right. They just didn't Poorly. go far enough in Roller no, right. Triple X, yeah, Triple X was a big hit that no one liked. Right. That okay. absolutely well, benefited. Like. <laughs> Triple X 3, I will stand for all day and all night. Maybe but, we should do all three Triple X's with Zach. We should just yeah, watch them. I'm into it. I, mean, I, I love I, the first one. I even like I two. like the third one. I've actually never seen the second one. Two is wild. Yeah. The second one is wild. Yeah. I will say that. I it's, have seen it's the second one. It's thoroughly wild. Yes. The second one is a... Uh, it's like an out-of-breath ice cube running from like Bulgarian parking lot to right. Bulgarian It's like a Washington, D.C. political <laughs> thriller. <laughs> And it's like the, the weirdest supporting like, cast. Ice, Ice Cube, it's like, he didn't even like really hit a treadmill. He's just like right from Are We There Yet? Yes. He's just like, yeah, give me a fucking submachine gun. I'll, I'll run around. And after the first movie is like, this is the, the most extreme is like, right, guy you've ever met. This guy like snowboards to like get breakfast or whatever. <laughs> like, he's well, got right. 80 abs. Right, which <laughs> commutes on a hang glider. Triple X 3 <laughs> does the same thing of like, right, this guy is addicted to thrills. He's doing the most extreme shit all the time. But this is the end, like the end all be all for him is living this way. This movie opens with Chris Klein street luging for 10 minutes. If you want to break into the NHL, which I think he does, this right? This is my point. Like, what if I go to my manager and I'm like, yeah, so any, you know, Ottawa Senators get back to me? No, nah, they're thinking about it. Okay, I'm going to do street losing. Right. Don't get hit by a car, buddy. Then or you're never going to play The illegal. cops are right. chasing you. <laughs> this movie has two different character setups happening simultaneously, and they can't pick which one it is. Because one is either he's Xander Cage. Right. This guy lives through the thrill, but the cops are always on his back. But then he would want to play role. Exactly. Right. Right. Then he would need to, to be him. talked into right. He goes, right. you know, there's a foreign country where you can play a sport that's so extreme and they'll pay you for it right. and make you famous. And he's like, I'm in. The other version of it is guy who's always this close right to get Right on the cusp of right. yeah, and professional athlete. And he's like, I think this year I'm finally going to make it. LL Cool J is like, look, dude, let's face facts. You're not making it. If you want to be an athlete, there's only one option left. Now, the sport's a little dangerous. I know you're not a thrill seeker. You wanted to play legit sports. Right. But if yeah, you come look. over here, you'll have a career. You've always wanted to be a goaltender. But how do you feel about roller skating in a rejected American gladiator ring while I ride a motorcycle next This to you? movie is doing both at the same time. It, it tries to argue that this guy is being paid so in? close. Uh, you're being paid in a Copex? <laughs> like, you're being paid in fake currency? This movie's trying to argue that he's like one hair away from making the Mighty Ducks, but also he lives for the thrill of death. Let's look up. The, the Tenge is the Kazakhstan currency. So it, now you could make this movie and it's like they're on a fucking island in the North Pole and they're being paid in Bitcoin or whatever. Sure. Like oh, yeah. we're, we're ready for Rollerball to be attempted again, I think. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a thing that's kind of a mind blower. We're now almost at the distance from McTiernan's rollerball that McTiernan's rollerball was from Norman Jewison's rollerball. That makes sense. Yeah, so this is ready. this movie is twenty two years old. It's like right. cicadas. Every uh, <laughs> <just> rollerball <laughs> goes dormant. And now I have a question about timeline because Please. I haven't seen the first film, but I looked it up, and it was made in what seventy seventy five seventy five. But it was set in 2005. It was set in the future. Zach. Now, this rollerball was, was set in 2018, set, to be was, clear. Yeah. Was set 
only a few years yes. after yeah. it was shot. Yeah. They pulled the uh, in the near future with it. Yes. Guess whose decision that was? John McTiernan, okay. the man who claims they sabotaged his movie. All right. Okay. I thought that was interesting. And I also, I don't know if it really qualifies as a sci-fi. Like, agreed. The movie, the, the first that one watched, really is. The right. first movie is more of a dystopian film. It's set in the future. The world is run by businesses. Right. right. This is just like, yeah, it's like two years later and it's in Kazakhstan. The yeah, first exactly. one, it's not really science right. fiction. The first one, and this is the thing, like the first one has a lot of issues, right? Sure. But you're like, the the actual, the sequences of Rollerball are undeniably thrilling. So I same, think the movie's good. Same for this one. James Conn, <laughs> perfect so, lead. So far, one to one. Perfect yeah. leading man. Perfectly cast. Um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> right, not a one-to-one -one there, maybe. Yeah. yeah, but it's in like it's ahead of like sort of RoboCop. Uh -huh. yep. I, it's it's I would argue very aligned with the Purge, where the argument, mm. the the sort of world of the movie is that like we have let big business take over society. Sure. We have our like quote unquote benevolent corporate oligarchs who run everything, and they've basically created like world peace. They've eradicated war. Everything is civil and hermetic and clean. And Rollerball is basically the purge televised. Mm. It's the one place where aggression is let out in society. It's sort of like the equivalent of public executions where people right, watch right. the sport. Circuses shit. Where people yeah, yeah, get yeah. thrown into this, you know, bloody mash mm -hmm. and try to survive. But it's like this is where the, the cultural uh, anger, frustration, violence gets released. And when they set out to remake this movie, that was, they were like, Look, it's even more, there's a way to evolve this. Yeah. And McTiernan went, no, 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 no. Just put it in a weird country. Yeah, we lost a little bit of that with, just, with this one. I, I crack open this dossier assuming I'm going to read, MGM refused to pay to set it in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Studio said it was less relatable it was in the future. They were ready to go with this movie takes place in the future. It's a collapsed society. Yeah. If I can shout out one of my favorite movies of recent years. Please. Alita Battle Angel. Which mm. does rollerball, basically. Which basically, they, which is a futuristic film, obviously. Have you danced with Alita? Yes. Yes, I, I loved Alita. It I, rolls. I believe it's called Murder Ball. Or no, that's that's an actual sport. I forget what yes, it is. Like, whatever the rollerball thing they play. That's awesome. Rolls. Like, and those sequences are great. Highlight of the movie. Right. And it's like underlining all of the like, here's what's happened to society yeah. stuff. Right. Motorball. 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 Right, right. Yeah. Murderball, of course, is uh, paraplegic basketball that is played right. in and is crazier than any of the sports we are discussing. Yes. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yes. 1975, Norman Jewison is a follow-up to Fiddler on the Roof and Jesus Christ Superstar made a movie called Rollerball. It is so bizarre that he made this. <laughs> I, it's, it's information that pops out of my head because it doesn't fit. Back in the day, it was like, do a sci-fi every yeah. so often, right? Those are hot, you know, especially in the 70s. Um, and it was also a... It was a talent sci-fi in a way that yeah. was a little it's rare. James Con, like three years after Godfather, right. he's a big deal. Pre Star Wars, it's kind of interesting that this was such a major movie from people at a at a major point in their career. And the film does well. JJ could not verify the it final was a gross. Success. No, but it was but a it success. Was a, yeah. It had sort of a cult following that lingered for a while. Like that movie's got interesting ideas. That movie's kind of effective. So this is interesting that MGM. Uh, at some point, owns United Artists, who made the original. They buy you. They buy Artists. it in the eighties. Yeah, and at some point in the nineties, they're like, "We should do video games with our properties." Uh, GoldenEye, the Nintendo sixty four game, right. is there one unqualified success right. from that initiative? But it, it it makes perfect sense. MGM is buying UA at the the way we watch all the time now when these companies buy other companies and immediately go, "What IP to exploit?" They go, "What are the three properties we have that are best suited for a video game?" James Bond, check. Rocky, check. Rocky and Rollerball are the other two. And then two. Rollerball's the third one. And people, I think, went, Rollerball, that's weird to be included. But you know what? You're right. That movie does feel like it's built to be a video game. But they eventually abandon it and decide, let's do a movie. Let's right. do it's, a remake. It seems like the process of them considering it for a video game made them realize, why wouldn't we just make a new movie? John McTiernan had just remade a Norman Jewison United Artists film, The Thomas Crown Affair. Yes, 13th ah. Warrior comes out after it, but he made that before In the it. timeline of his career, yes. Uh, and they liked that movie. Do you like that movie? Pierce Brosnan, Steel and Art? Haven't seen that one. Gentleman Criminal? Do you like a it Gentleman sounds, Criminal? Yeah, it sounds right up my alley. It's, it's You'll a, like it. It's You'd a like wonderful it. film, but it's classic Hollywood thinking of, we just worked with this director who did a good job remaking a different director's movie. Why wouldn't we rehire him to do a different remake of that previous director's 
obviously, other film. At that point, yes, he had made two kind of like bizarre flops, Last mm-hmm. Action Hero and The 13th Warrior. Yeah. But neither of them are, I think, fiascos in the way this movie. I mean, nothing is a fiasco in the way this movie is. So yeah. they can kind of hand wave it with like, look, man, he did Die Hard with a Vengeance. That rocked. He did Thomas Crown. That was so right. successful. I think like, Last Action Hero is seen as like classic studio success. People were sick of That's him. That's the other thing. Yeah. I think it gets pinned more on this just Schwarzenegger's folly. I think at the time of that movie, it's pinned on Arnie. I think 13th Warrior, they're like, well, that whole thing just went pear-shaped. And then uh, fucking Thomas Crown was one of those movies that like gets someone back in good standing where they were like, this shouldn't have worked. He made a solid hit late summer for grownups. And McJernan is like, that's my favorite movie that I've made since Mm -hmm. Hunt for Red October. I wanted to make an adult love story. MGM let me. And so I love MGM. Like, I'll do anything. Says a lot of movies are radio plays with visual aids the way television used to be. Uh, Rollerball is entirely visual, completely different from anything I've done before. You may die hard. Is, what are you talking about? All of the quotes that he's JJ has like pulled up. It's a fucking black box theater director. Temporary <laughs> amnesia. He keeps making these statements that are incompatible with someone who has directed Die Hard and Predator. He says that the, we've counted the number of shots in the film. It's nearly 9,000. Clockwork Orange only has 470. He says all right, two things about that. One, Stanley Kubrick does long takes. Everybody knows that. Two, am I supposed to be like excited that it has 9,000 shots. No, that doesn't sound well, good. In terms of dollar per shot value, <laughs> you know, these shots are cheap. Also, here's a complaint I have about this movie right off the dome. Too many shots. Yeah, definitely would be my first note. I found it disorienting and hard to follow. It's just like, I'm like, I'm launching a new restaurant. Oh, yeah. okay. What's your vibe? I'm like, so many restaurants only have 50 menu items. I'm doing 5,000 right off the bat. <laughs> there will you be, can get anything here. There will be like 30 second dialogue scenes in this movie that I swear have 29 cuts <laughs> and the cuts are between angles that are two degrees off from each other. Okay. I feel like it works for about the first 30 minutes. <laughs> I, look, I agree with you that for the first 30 minutes, it's not like I'm like, this is great. Yeah. But I am following what's I'm going on. I'm having fun. I'm going... Okay, I kind of see what they're going for, and then it go, and then I go, oh, they're not going for what I thought they were going for. <laughs> basically, <laughs> the broadcast is great. That like, was the broadcast, the version. best idea. Yes, yes. you know, yes. is like this is pro wrestling plus roller derby plus motorcycles. The and graphics it, and the aesthetics. Yes. It often right. seemed like that was that was the only part of the movie where they kept the original idea of like. You're getting those like sponsored reads yes. in the middle of it, like, oh, this is a capitalism thing. Mm-hmm. That almost completely goes away, like that specific critique for the rest of the movie. Well, there's this thing of like McTiernan. I mean, we're getting to this, but like McTiernan being like, you don't need to set this in the future. That's like a distancing effect for the audience. We're already close enough to the society where this would happen. Just set it in a country that's less advanced than us in a way that feels weirdly xenophobic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or uh, reductive. Yes. Reductive. Uh, yes. I mean, I don't think... I'll, I'll see if this comes up, but I don't think McTiernan like, went to Kazakhstan and spent a month there being like, let me really soak it up here. No, like, what's what going on culture? here? <laughs> His <laughs> line of thinking was like... He's just set, like, I don't know, those animals will watch anything. Set it in some lawless country that no one cares about was basically his line of thinking. Which... I mean, is also pretty much what led Borat to be, you know, like Borat that is 100% just right. them being like, let's just find a country with a funny name. People have like, no cultural right. associations with this place. It's just a name that they vaguely heard. They'll believe anything we tell them. Yeah. Uh, we need to introduce a figure who is important as much as you're going to regret Knowles. it. Harry Knowles is very important at very right. various steps of the legacy Obviously, of this movie. This film is also being developed. Um, at the peak of his power, that's the thing. of his influence over the movie. Industry. This movie, you know who up, Harry Knowles is. Yes, obviously. I I know none of the context around this movie to the point where when I told Griffin I wanted to do it, then I texted him like two days later, going, "Holy what shit! I, I just looked what, at the Wikipedia. Right, yeah. what, what Pandora's I didn't box know there was yeah. prison involved? You were thinking exactly. like, oh, Rollerball? That's like a piece of junk that we can have some right. fun chatting about. Yeah, I like, just remember it was some crazy, you know, over the top right. movie. Right, and then Zach texted me. I just got to the controversy section <laughs> yeah. of the Wikipedia page. So I also know nothing about what we're about so to learn here. If you think about it, like 2000, right, post Phantom Menace, Harry right. Knowles is king of the nerds on in the internet 1.0. 98 and 99 are Batman and Robin and Phantom Menace, which are the two movies where studios start to step back and going, is this guy actually having an effect 
on the reaction to these movies. Right. Is him like bad mouthing our scripts as he gets them leaked? Yes. Bad mouthing the movies when they come out, like actually depressing interest in these Are films. Are people actually looking the to this guy as a bellwether? Now, the answer now I could go and tell them yep. is no, the no. Phantom Menace was hugely successful and Batman and Robin didn't do well because it wasn't what the culture wanted at the time. <laughs> yes. Like, you know, I actually enjoy things about that film, but you know, yeah, it yeah. was not I, meeting I, the culture, yes. right? But but he basically was a one-man Twitter at that point, Yeah, sure. where it was like the industry looking online and being like, people are making fun of us. But beyond that, are we like not Roller in on the Ball, show? that's a sci-fi film. That's where he's going to flex his power the most. I mean, he was such a big, like, 70s genre guy, and this is an era where things are getting remade all the time, that I feel like he was a guy where Blank Studios announces remake of Blank starring Blank. He would just do the all caps, fuck you, don't do this. Then would write a soliloquy acting like Rollerball was the greatest American film of all time. There was a lot of that shit of him being like, don't touch my class. But not with Rollerball. The thing is, this he is gets why his, it's fascinating. He gets his hand on the first script for this remake written by David C. Wilson. And it, that film was set in a post-apocalyptic future. That right. film was not doing what this movie, and this that is script was an era where there, like, there will be potential remakes that are floating around. He'll get the script early. He will badmouth the script so hard on his site that they're like hard reset, back to development, right. movie canceled. Else. If he gives us a bad review of the first draft, we're done. He says in every single facet, the scripts are uh, an improvement on the original. In every single facet. Well, in every wow, a very I different agree. script than what sure, we saw. Sure, sure. Yes. Right. And I actually tried to hunt around for it. I have not been able to find Me it. Either. It doesn't seem to be viewable. No. It sounds like a fairly hard sci-fi script, though. Yes. It's set in this like mega corporate, like post, you know, apocalyptic future. There are no books anymore. Everything is visual. Like, but it sounds cool. It sounds cool. McTiernan it's, comes on and he's like, boring, Kazakhstan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like genuinely. Yes. Right. And then and then they're like, well, who do you want? Like for the lead? Like who's the modern day James Khan? And his response is, I think it should be some goofy, deeply uncool simpleton. He basically says he picks Chris Klein because Chris Klein feels like Jimmy Stewart, not the guy who would be in an action movie. So you're just like, wait a second. They hand him a script that's like, hey, this is tailor-made for any of the great current action stars, and it's set in a cool post-apocalyptic future, a dystopia, and he's just like, no, foreign country, He, I mean, Oz like, from American Pie. Like you said, he's like, do you need to go in the future to make it plausible that people get hurt so that others get rich? Nonsense. All you have to do is get it out of North America or Western Europe. I, You know, I understand, like, being like, look, these post-Soviet republics, like, there is a lot of, like, gangsterism like you can make a movie about that if you really want to make a movie about that if that's you yeah. can't just shortcut to like mad max is happening over there sure. essentially which is what they have done yeah and uh, also like you know it's very plausible that that would be happening here yes so that's the thing him saying like it's just not in america i'm like because then his point is like also the wwe and you're like that's in america right, right. And I yeah. know that's that's the staged. part of it that I think is rude for him to be like this could only happen in a less developed country. Yeah, you lose a lot of the teeth of the commentary yes. by being like, well, right. you know, America is immune to this. Like, but yeah, the thing is, whatever Harry Knowles is saying about this original sure. script had like commentary built in. This film does not have commentary it does not. in it, apart from like, well, there's the a rich. commentator. <laughs> there is, yeah. Apart You're from right. that, there there's is color commentary. <laughs> There is color commentary. But it's like rich guys will will do anything to make a buck. But like that's about it. Well, that's like on. the end of it. There was one point that they really drove home. I'll call it the night crawler effect. Go ahead. Where Go ahead. they have the live global ratings number. And they don't say it out loud ever. But if you're, if you're a really nuanced film watcher, <laughs> you will notice that when the violence happens, Number goes up. It is my. It's what is it? It's called like it's the global so, rating I index think it or global something. Rate, yeah. And it's literally just like twenty, and yes. then someone gets punched in like twenty one, yes. and John Reno yes. like, "All right," and he like lights a cigar. And well, when they're just playing like a really good game of rollerball, right. it's at like seven. It's like, um, <laughs> yeah. So you know, there's a little commentary in there about they cut to that our thing. appetite for violence. Yes, they cut to that ratings number so many times. I like. Yes, it, it's like. <laughs> 
Eh, whatever. Uh, Any Given Sunday is a film that came out like a couple of years sure. ago. That's a movie that I feel like is trying to thread this needle a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, in a American context. I I, I want to. I just want to get this out of the way. I, a movie that I feel successfully achieves what this movie is uh -huh. kind of trying to do and is also a remake of a beloved 70s genre movie. I think Paul W.S. Anderson's Death Race uh -huh. is very similar to this. Right. Where it's like a pretty loose remake that goes like prison state. We care so little for the incarcerated. We force them to play like Mario Kart they, they, to the Mario death. Mario Kart with spikes. Yes, for television. Exactly. Yes. I mean. And it's all about like, you know, Joan but, Allen as the warden slash mogul. There's another trying to get ratings boosted. racing film that, yeah, that is, does this better. Speed Racer. Right. Which is also basically set in a dystopia, just like a colorful one. I just think there's something to... I mean, talk about, like, you know, it may be being time to remake this movie again. There is a cross-section in terms of, like, real-life issues of, like, A, the, like, college sports system, right? That, yeah, like, yeah, commodifies yeah. Yeah, sure. yes. these young men, and especially football, where it's like, are we pushing people into potentially life-affecting injuries for the sake of, like, our own enjoyment and jersey sales and whatever. And also, I feel like there's something in the idea of remaking Rollerball of, like, the the pipeline to the military in the United States of, like, the only way so many people in this country are given any chance of freedom for their future is, like, you got to do something really barbaric and dangerous for a couple years. And if you survive it on the other end, you built a life for yourself. There, there's something about shipping people off to Rollerball well, there's also a version of remaking this one, not the original, yes. where the modern conversation around sports washing and like the Saudi wealth fund yes. is like buying up every American sports league That's all and all stuff. the Americans are going over there and basically lending legitimacy to that effort. It's all like, stuff that's weirdly in the soup of this, this version yeah. that isn't in the original. Right. That's almost ahead of its time, but the movie fucks up. There's a McTiernan quote where he says, this is from a movie line interview in August 2001. So this is when, I guess, before the movie got pushed back when he was promoting its original release. He said, I might be so far out there on Rollerball that this could be another time I get my head handed to me. He was right, in a sense. Yes. But lack of failure is clear evidence of either being an absolute genius or being a coward. I know Rollerball is exciting for me. I hope it's exciting for the audience. And it is enormously political. Someone said recently, this movie is about your Hollywood bosses. Yeah, look, I, in the 90s, obviously, he, he tussled mm -hmm. with a lot of CEOs and I think with a lot of uh, big name stars. Yeah. Because he also says, like, best thing about making a genre movie, you don't need a $20 million guy. Genre sells the movie. Right. So I don't need to knock on the door of a big star like also, a Mel Gibson, whatever. Remakes where he's like two movies where the IP Already is the star. In. Right. Pierce Brosnan's obviously a big deal and he's Bond and someone he's well, worked he with knows before. that guy. Yeah, 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 Right, but it's it's very different than working with an Arnold or a Connery or someone like that. And he, like, loves the fact that this movie, he's like, I can pluck a guy who's not... But it, it's funny, though, that he's like, I can pluck this yokel to play this moron. Like, Chris Klein's, like, sitting there like, oh, okay. He's like, this fucking guy, you know how cheap he came? He's saying these quotes while promoting <laughs> yes, the movie. he's paying me to be in the movie, <laughs> okay. basically. Um, look... Have you seen Say It Isn't So, the yes, other film that Chris I, Klein did? I think he's good in that. You are clearly the biggest Chris Klein fan in I the world. I think Chris Klein's comedy career in its first wave was pretty good. I think he has a, a charming presence to him, you yes. know? I'll, um, I'll give you that. There, yeah. There's, there's something interesting to him as a character type in, in the right roles, right? Where he is so guileless. He feels like the type of guy you should Talk hate. This guy right here. <laughs> what? And on uh, Chris Klein's Instagram, here's a picture of him making what it's I just, guess you would call a goofy face. A, 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 a soy face. The, uh, <laughs> Posting in a laptop making a goofy face. It's the jerk would, would call but it. But this is kind of the thing. I feel like he played... He seems guileless to this day. He played yes. these guys, right, where it was like incredibly like handsome, corn-fed sort of jockey types where you're like, God, I fucking hate this guy. This guy's probably such an asshole. And he's like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, there's sure. something disarming about how nice and sort of like clueless he seems to be. 
There's something very like puppy dog about him. He seems lovely. He he's also this you know he said he was 21 years old when he made this movie. Which he's is like insane. a true wow. baby. And this is like he's his like it was a hundred million dollar project. He was being directed by the director of Die Hard and Predator. I yeah. did my best. The movie doesn't work. It wasn't for lack of effort on my part. If he's making an effort, you don't really notice it. But it it's yes, he's. It's not really his quote unquote fault. No, like election is kind of famously uh, Alexander Payne spotted him when I think they were scouting the high yeah. school, and he's just brilliant in that. But it's like you well, know, you're like this he's might a natural, right? Like, you're you like, know, is this just the one he's perfect just a use of this guy, right? And then I think the fact that he replicated a couple times to lesser degrees. He's terrible in American Pie. You you keep acting like America. He's Look, I think he's good in American Pie. One. That's in that is actually an opinion <laughs> you need to think about. You need to go and sit down and think about it. American Pie. Okay, so of the four the four boys are him, Jason Biggs, Thomas Ian Nicholas, and Eddie K. Thomas, right? Yes, because Stifler's kind and of like, adjunct uh, member. Stifler in the first is obviously movie. the biggest success of American Pie. Right. So let's set him. But aside. in the first movie, Stifler's kind of a slimer. He's an antagonist who slowly becomes a friend. Right. And like then he like drinks cum and runs into a wall. <laughs> You've seen American Pie. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler for any of our listeners who haven't seen American Pie. Stifler drinks cum and walks into a wall. <laughs> so if I'm ranking the boys. Boys of American Pie. The Finch only the thing best. I know is that Klein is bottom. Finch, that's Eddie K. Thomas, or is that Thomas Ian Nicholas? Uh, I always mix those two up. Eddie K. Thomas is Finch. He's the best. And he's the best one. Mom. He's the best one. Right. And then I think I, uh, Biggs is a comfy Correct. number two. And then I'm going to... What you think? You think Klein over Thomas Ian Nicholas? He's I'll give you that. the wettest blanket in the world. Yeah, all right. You know what? All right. Rookie of the Year goes bottom. Because the other yeah. thing, Klein in American Pie is the one oh, of the group... That was the guy from Rookie of the Year. He's the rookie. Bad guy. He's the one wow. who's Tara Reed's... Yeah, yes. yeah, Because like, yeah. the dilemmas are like... Biggs has no girlfriend, masturbates into a sock. His dad won't shut up about sex. He fucks a pie. <laughs> yes. Eventually, he ends up with Alice and Hannigan. Right. Klein in, in the second movie. Well, that's when they fall in love. He Klein does lose is like the alpha jock, but no one wants to fuck this him. Is, I can't remember no, why. No, no, I don't this really, is what I kind of like about what's it. What's his our Klein is like super jock football yeah. player where you're like, why is he hanging out with these nerds? But it's like he's such a sweet guy. He's he doesn't think about social strata. He is the one in the group who has had sex. No, he hasn't. No, none of them have had he sex. He describes it like apple pie. The yeah, no, 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 no. He's talking about blowjobs when he says that. Griffin, you clearly don't remember. He's not talking about blowjobs. He's talking about fingering. Or whatever. Yes. He's talking okay, about stop fighting. Sex. Stop fighting. He's talking about non I wish sexual. I had prepped he's by watching American Pie. I, I had no idea this was going to come I rewatched this movie but. like a year ago. In my memory, Chris Klein has had sex. No. They, and that's no, why they're virgins. That's the whole point of the movie. The point is that he's not really part of it. No, At the end of the movie, he's the one person. Person who doesn't sleep with his girlfriend. That is correct. What you are miss, what you are construing here is that he's the one who actually is like, I didn't do it, and who cares? Like that's what you're. I've always read is he has had sex no, before, and that's why he's whole, not part of it. Their whole pact is the four of them. They're all virgins. Okay, like, we will okay, okay, He's patting them on the back. Let's you start watching American Pie right now. It's going no, on the bracket. We're keep talking. Eddie K. Thomas is Tara Reed. Who's the fourth? Oh, and then uh, no, Eddie K. Thomas uh, sleeps with Jennifer Coolidge. Obviously, he's the pretentious Stifler's one. He's mom. the snob. He's funny. He's got a flask. He's the best. And then Thomas Ian Nicholas is with Tara Reid. Right. The the structure. Of They're that the movie, ones where you're just like you're just in a serious relationship. Like you're gonna have sex. You don't need to be making any goofy packs. Chris like, Klein's you guys funny because the whole thing is that he's a jock who's trying to make himself seem like more of a nerd because Mina Savari's not into him. Right. So he has to join the chorus. Right. He sings. Yeah. yeah Scooby that's right. Dooby. He's funny oh, in it. You're not making it sound good. Scooby Dooby. I, I think we might also be right for an American Pie reboot. Yeah. We start from the bottom. And Starring we... us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. We're a bunch of dudes in our 30s. Let's lose our virginities. I will never forget Spike Lee being like, the guy sticks his dick in a pie. That's a movie, like like yeah. in some like interview. And well, this is the like, God, this is really... the other thing with that movie. This is why Thomas Ian Nicholas's character. Well, I'm, oh. To be clear, the film is directed by Blank Check. Uh, the, the, uh, good favorites. friend Chris Weiss. Chris Weiss, yes. But I can remember the other characters' names. I can't even remember Thomas Ian Nichols' character because it's Finch, it's here. Oz, Oz, it's what? Jim, Jim. Of course, he of Jim's dad. Of course. And I forget what the other and then guys there's fucking like, name uh, is. The Shermanator, Stifler, Stifler. 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 Nadia, Nadia. Well, I'm happy to tell you that Thomas Ian Nicholas's character is called Kevin. Oh, <laughs> what he, a guy! It's a clear case like Caddyshack, where he was supposed to be the lead of the movie, 
He's the yeah. normal guy. He's the normal guy, right? Because he's the one with Binks the most stable the weirdo, relationship. Fucking a pie, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the whole thing is that Casey Affleck hands him the Book of Love. Casey Affleck Wait, is what? in American Pie. Casey Affleck plays Kevin's brother, who says there's a book that I've hidden that has all the secrets of how to have sex. And the second movie, they call up Casey Affleck again. And Casey Affleck's like, the secret is in the summer after your that. first year of college, you have to rent a house with Stifler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The secret is your contract said you were obligated to do this film. In an expanded role, he's now second build. <laughs> um, oh, boy. But he's clearly supposed to be like the audience surrogate central Thomas, leading man, normal yeah, guy. Nichols. Sure, rookie of the year. Yes, right, and then right. everyone else pops in that movie where he's just kind of the boring guy in the movie. And then they don't bring Klein back for American Wedding, which I think is a combination of he had gotten too big while also bombing. He was not worth the amount of money it would have cost to have him play the fourth guy when also he was on a bad run. We should also shout out that, of course, this film has L. Cool J in it. It does. Much like uh, Ice Cube, who I was just being mean about, but is kind of similar to L. Cool J, where you're like, they're always going to be fine. Those guys sort of know how to behave yeah. somewhat They're charismatically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like Hello Cool J is always compelling. Like they don't usually get much to do in any of these movies. No. Like the, the, the rappers turned actors of the nineties, yeah. like, but you know, Presence. but like they're fine. Yeah. yeah. Now he has nothing to do with nothing. this film. Like really, he's basically come do rollerball. After this, I, his work is done. Like, I was watching it, assuming the twist was going to be that he was, he was in, in on, on it. it. Right? Yes. And he was setting Chris Clamp for the fall. And instead, halfway through, he's like, "Hey, man, I got a heart out on this project." He's the guy who can just you help me escape so I can move on to, to another. Chris shoot? Klein, what's happening? Yeah. Yes. Out. But he's like, hey, it. man, like, do, have you noticed that something's going on? <laughs> but also, feels like of, those numbers go up when we get punched. I cannot, like, I just want to restate. This movie opens with extended street luging sequence yep. that this uh, article I read said was much longer in the original R-rated Ooh. cut. Cops are chasing him. You think they're going to swarm around him. LL Cool J pulls up in a luxury sports car, opens the door. He's like, hey, man, get in. Pulls him in. You're like, who is this guy? He's like, hey, man, I'm pitching it to you one last time. You should do rollerball. He's like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do rollerball. He's like, please do rollerball. Hard cut to Kazakhstan. They're both playing rollerball. This all happens within like five minutes yeah. where this movie isn't. This is the other thing. You imagine the part of the setup in both versions that I said, the one where it's like this guy lives for the edge. Mm -hmm. You want to do the most dangerous sport in the world or the one where he wants to make the NHL. And it's like, dude, you're not going to cut it. Your only option is to play rollerball. In both cases, you imagine that scene starts with like, Hey man, I heard about something. It's a little yeah, underground. Like, sure, yeah. Yeah, right, right. You're not supposed to talk about it, but Right. And instead, he's pitching it to him like it's pickleball. Yes. <laughs> he's right, like, like this thing is on the verge of breaking out. Right, you know, yeah. rollerball. I pitched it to you 5 times. Are you going to accept it this time? Look, yes, I guess I will. Do you remember slam ball? Yeah. It's an era of people being like, can we just like plus up a sport right. a little bit? Like can and sell the TV rights? The Spike TV version of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. What the fuck is slam ball? Slam ball was basketball with trampolines and in, in the paint. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There was, Interesting. And when you watched it like five, if you watched it for five seconds, you were like, they've invented the perfect sport. And then after five more seconds, you were like, oh, this is unwatchable. So kept, sort of like rollerball. Yes, yeah. It had a similar arc. Of, they kept trying to do <laughs> this. Promising. Like XFL was the same thing where you were like, fuck. Well, yeah. This sounds like it could be really cool. And then 10 minutes in, it's Jack Donaghy standing behind the monitor going, shut it down. <laughs> it's the thing where like you think it's a good pitch. And the second you watch it actually happen, when all the money's been spent, you're like, I failed to recognize the fatal flaw. If all of the floor is trampolines, no one can walk. <laughs> yeah. Now it's not all the floor; it's just the I'm courts. Sorry. The, the, the you know, I think there's six total trampolines um, on, on the floor. But <laughs> it's true that once they started being on the trampolines, it's you know they they lose a little bit of control of their bodies. They're yes. jumping up in the air. But another reason why 2002 is like the perfect time for a rollerball remake. Mm -hmm. It's this era where everyone's like, it's been a while since there was a new sport, and the future of sports is extreme. Extreme, yeah. Were you an extreme sports guy in the oh, early yeah. 2000s? I was a X Games, X Games viewer. I was a, you know, Did you Tony, play Tony Hawk, Hawk player. Me yeah. Uh, yep. Did you ever do any of that stuff yourself? Oh, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> same, same. No, no. I my played bones, so much Tony uh, Hawk. I love my bones. <laughs> <laughs> Good bones. So yeah, I don't want to great bones on you, buddy. destroy them. Okay, in this opening scene, yeah. I had a brief vision of, 
I so I did have this DVD. I have no memory of the movie from when I owned it. I, 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 and I sorry, just to build off this because I, I should have asked this question earlier. Yes, you bought it rather than rented it because yeah. of the R-rated thing, which I fell prey to a bunch too. You're the right age. You see, there's an R-rated cut I of a movie. Buy, yeah. Unrated cut, you go. I, I'm probably gonna see boobs. Right? It was probably a grocery store. You totally. know, like yeah, yeah. that yeah. thing's on a carousel. This is also an era. I mean, this is why DVDs exploded. Is like they went way down in price really quickly, mm -hmm. where suddenly it was worth it to just own 40 DVDs. Yes, yeah. but wait, 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 all right. So you have no memory. My, of this is my follow up question. Did you watch it a lot or did you watch it one time and then go like, nah, I shouldn't have bought that, put I, it on a shelf? I think I watched it once and just okay. was like, that wasn't my favorite. Got um, yeah. yeah. So you had 14 year old since then. Probably. Yeah. Just no, I have definitely know. not seen it since then. Wow. No. Um, but in watching that opening scene, I was like, is this movie about to be good? And also, is this movie about to be Fast and Furious? Because. Yes. I could see a version of this movie where you slow play it much more. Yep. You start with kind of a a you know indie drama about this street long border. He slowly falls into this world. Right. Yes. Then then we're cooking with gas. Yes. But they they really they went for like fast five, but in the twentieth minute of the first movie. I mean, this is jumping way ahead. Oh, oh no. Well, we're going to ruin the, the the really stiff midsection of the film. This was a movie that, among other legal issues, led to a lawsuit between studios because they tried to advertise it as from the filmmakers that brought you Fast and the Furious. After this movie was pushed back, it ended up coming out the year after yeah. Fast and Furious, even though it was In supposed to come out. In what is it connected to the Fast and the Furious? Uh, like John Pogue wrote Rollerball, but only served as an executive producer on Fast and Furious. In response to the ads, Universal sued MGM in federal court, calling for a restraining order that would remove the ads from circulation. Right, relax, guys. Come on, who cares? But they were so badly trying to make people think. I mean, it makes sense. A movie that's made in a silo separate from Fast and Furious, sure. but after Fast and Furious, they were yeah. like, this is the way people want the story told. Now, this is my second trailer-based lawsuit film <laughs> that covered, is a good covered on, on Blank Check. That and that, that case did finally settle yesterday, the, yesterday? since we've done yeah. the episode. I'm I, trying to I remember what the resolution so. was. I think the resolution was the judge was like, did go away. Did heads get their, <laughs> their justice? Because as I said, I've always been very pro the the end of the armas, uh, army. Of course, yes. you don't want them on your bad no. side. Those guys will sue you into oblivion. Yeah. Quote, uh, it a self-inflicted injury. <laughs> Judge dismisses lawsuit <laughs> claiming yesterday trailer tricked on a Armas fence. A self-inflicted wow. injury. That's cold. He has thrown out the five million dollar lawsuit. Right. And now they tweet about him every day and they're going to like, you know, swat his house or whatever. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, we should also mention this film features Rebecca Romaine, who coming off of X-Men, where she played Mystique uh -huh. uh, and had delivered one line, yes, but w is, in my opinion, good in X-Men. I agree. And is very good in X2, where yeah. they actually give her shit to do. I think she's great in both of those movies. I think she's better than Jennifer Lawrence, as Mystique, at least. I would agree with that. Like, Jennifer Lawrence is fine as, like, Jennifer hero. Lawrence. Yes. Right. Well, they just morphed that character into right, such a weird thing in order to suit the fact that they had America's biggest movie star playing that role. Off of that, she got Rollerball and Femme Fatale. Now, Femme Fatale is actually an awesome movie and she's really good in it. But flopped really hard. Big flop. This film is not awesome and she's not as good in it, I no. would say. Again, a tough role. A tough role. In, tough role. In 2002, I like all four of these people, right? In my... Sure. You mean including the uh, John Renault. Yes. Yeah. In 2002, I'm like, I have seen all of these people in movies recently where I enjoyed them. I think that's also probably why I bought it. I was like, I love LL Cool J. Totally. I, I, I like Rebecca Romain's name. You know, yeah. I like, you know. And then, you yeah, I, I just, I remember being, I think you were saying this, David. I remember being very excited for this movie when it came out, even though the buzz around it was so bad. I was excited too, because I was like, that's a can't miss. I was like, even the junkiest version of this movie, right. I will find entertaining. And I was also like, you know what's a great title? Rollerball. Yeah. What's better than and, that? And I like all four of these people in other shit. I don't think I cared about that. But I was just kind of like, John McTiernan's remaking Rollerball. How bad could it and be? And then the reviews were so toxic that I was like, I shouldn't go. I actually, you've talked me out of it. So I probably was into this cast on paper. You take half a step back and you're like, those four people in the same movie is not going to work. That's a bad combination. Let me now read from the dossier for a little bit about the production of the film, Please. okay? 
Number one. Calm. Normal. McTiernan. McTiernan's first thing as it's coming out is he says the film is decapitated. The third act was supposed to be Spartacus. Yeah. They didn't let me shoot. They didn't let me shoot the big my battle. ending. It's because, you know, at the end of the film, the uprising in this film is basically just like he roller skates into Jean Reno's office and shoots him. Right. The end. They, like, they do they chant Jean. They chant, which just encourages yeah. him to do it by himself. <laughs> right. Yeah. It doesn't really feel like a. Because in the original film, that's what happens. Like the whole point is that the powers that be are like James Conn's getting too famous he sure. will be able to control the audience right we got to take him out uh, McTiernan in 2023 Griffin mm -hmm. so He's still doing interviews about this movie says like Ford versus Ferrari right I that's a movie that yep. that's what I wanted to do a move you know a movie that's about racing but it's really about business and about the movie business right and we talked like, about this in our Ferrari episode absolutely. but like that that movie is this incredibly durable metaphor for like being a filmmaker in the studio system trying to make above average entertainment. Where, what's the line here? He says, uh, a film director is like the racing driver. He isn't the one who makes the engine work or makes the car go fast. It's a whole team of other people. But somewhere in there, you need this madman who will try to control the whole machine. It's something they say in the movie several times. Every now and then, the driver just doesn't make it out. You wish he could have. I'm pro a movie like that. Yes. That's not present in this film. Would you agree? I would agree. Every, <laughs> but every now and then, the baller doesn't make it out. But like... <laughs> you could apply that same... <laughs> Zach has already identified the extent to which that's in that film, which is there's a screen that has a number on it yes. that goes up or down. <laughs> right. Like, that's that's the only and, way this film weighs and in And at the that. end, Chris Klein rollerballs into Jean Reno's face. Um, <laughs> and Naveen Andrews' face. Yes. Yep. To, to, jump, to j just jump to outcome stuff before we get into the plot of the film, as yeah. it were. We said, you know, Harry Knowles reads the script, is like, thumbs up. This is fucking good. I'm excited. He's also like, it's McTiernan. Yeah. This will probably, with this script and McTiernan, this should work, right? Yeah. They fly Harry Knowles out to a test screening. This is the era where the studios they are trying to out. court him. Knowing that, like... If he doesn't like it, he's going to write about it. You but know. the other thing in this era is like Sony flies him out for the Godzilla premiere yeah. at Madison Square Garden. And he's like, this movie rules. It was the best night of my life. This thing's a triumph. The audience was losing their minds. Then the movie comes out. People dislike it. A week or two later, he goes, pays to go see it at a mall, writes a second review and is like, I was wrong. The studio kind of like buttered me up. They got me in the spirit of the thing. I was swayed. So Harry Knowles is already in this zone where the studios are like, we might be able to curry favor with him enough that he'll give us a, an easy pass on anything. And his audience is starting to question his reliability. They fly him out. They give him VIP treatment. I think they put him up at a nice hotel. He writes about all this shit in his piece because he's a great journalist. And then he's like, this movie sucks so fucking hard. Sure. I sat next to McTiernan. Everyone was nice to me. They paid my travel. This thing is dog shit. This movie has two good things going for it. It has tits and blood. Everything else in it is a fucking disaster. And MGM's response is, we should cut the tits and the blood out. He's just doomed this movie with his negative review. We should make it a PG-13 so right. it at least can appeal least to younger children. Right. So they immediately cut... And then you can say, like, this review doesn't even apply anymore. Yes. Like, you right. can't even... And then we can sell the R-rated DVD to Zach at a supermarket <laughs> yep. a year from now and make the money back. He uh -huh. called it the worst conceived series of nonsensical action I've ever seen. McTiernan, it is so funny to imagine McTiernan, this, like, grizzled, grumpy yes. Juilliard graduate sitting next to fucking Harry Knowles like at the height of his little nerd king, you know, like, you need to like just being kiss like, the ring. What do you think? And Noel's just like, uh, you know, like what a weird moment in right. pop culture. Now, internally, to be clear, Harry Knowles is like a bad dude. Horrible. Like, yes, uh, as much has been written a about degenerate. that. Degenerate. Yes. With bad taste. Who's well, that's also, also a true. bad writer. But this is because he's so in the crosshairs. And this is also, I think, around this time. Revolution Studios announces like a three picture development deal with Harry Knowles. That was the first time a studio was like, well, why don't we let you consult on other films? Why don't we let you develop your own projects? Because you seem to know what Hollywood should be doing. And the thought was, oh, they're paying him. And now he's not going to give any Revolution movie a bad review. So his like honesty is very much in question. And when he attacks this movie, McTiernan, the studio all say like, He's doing this just to prove that he can't be bought. He doesn't actually hate it. We yeah, think this movie. They tried good. to do the double negative, and it's yes. like you know, you made a shitty movie. 
The the other sign, obviously, apart from the fact that yes, they recut it to get a PG thirteen, they delayed the release, all this stuff, is that um, there was this issue, and we can discuss this more on our basic episode as mm-hmm. well. That um, McTiernan uh, hired private investigator Anthony Pelicano to conduct an illegal wiretap on the producer of the film. Yes. So that's definitely a sign of like behind the scenes drama. There's a little bit of an interesting narrative. One could argue more interesting than the film itself, where he was convinced that the big corporate powers of the entertainment industry were trying to ruin his movie. But I think you have to factor that in when you watch. That's the meta movie. It is. When you watch the movie, you know, he was just on theme about. Corporate power. Yeah, we've <laughs> got to get inside every fucking tunnel. They're all they're they're trying to mess with me. It the numbers go up and down. Am I right? Interesting that this is the movie that happened on. Uh, it's so crazy. I mean, we there's this big conversation between Pelicano and McTiernan that is what brings McTiernan down. Correct? Like, right. there's some wiretap. There's like a 20 minute phone call that I believe they played in its entirety in court. By the way, we're doing an entire Patreon episode on Pelicano. We're doing an episode on Sin Eater, the crimes of Anthony Pelicano. Yes. The documentary. And that will be the episode because we're obviously touching upon it here. We'll touch upon it on basic. It's too big a story to fit into episodes on the movies themselves. Especially when we have to talk about Rollerball. We have to talk about Rollerball. So you got to go into enemy territory, Mm -hmm. then up through the tunnel. Yeah. Then down, yeah. Then around again, and yeah. then you throw the ball into the the, the gong and thing. He, and I remember he specifically says you have to throw it hard enough that it sets off the pyrotechnics. Got to make sparks. Never an issue. They no one ever just <laughs> yes. like lightly touches it and doesn't <laughs> score. You can't just go like eh. you got to go. Whoa! But we we wouldn't know if you could. The hard cut from LL Cool J going, "Come on, man, do a little roller ball," and Chris Klein going, "Fine." To Kazakhstan, Chris Klein in the ring. I don't know if he's been playing for five years, if this is his third game, but he seems to already be a superstar. The thing is huge. About 40 minutes later, he's called the most famous rollerballer ever. So, Well, and they try to immediately like set up like, you know, this longstanding rivalry he has with evil Scarface lady. Everyone thinks they hate each other. And I'm like, I'm not getting any of this. But um, he, within the first game you see him play, his friend, what's his friend's name again? Toba. Toba. His friend's helmet comes off, and while he's scrambling, looking for his helmet, trying to get it back on, he's, like, fucking murked. He gets he gets a ball to that dome, basically. Now, why was Toba on the team? Oh, Toba seems oh, bad uh, no, at rollerball. No, no, we are already in trouble here. <laughs> okay. I feel like... I know. Like, I don't so even know what people's positions are. <laughs> yeah, the about, only positions uh, are like roller skates or motorcycle, right? Well, like, if, if you know a little murder, bit about murder, roller derby, yeah. there's, you know, the certain guys. Yes, exactly. So okay. I think he's playing that type but of position. But it seemed like he couldn't barely skate. Correct. That is the problem with Toba. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because because, because there, as soon as his, his helmet mask came is off, pretty big, too. As soon as his helmet came off, he started doing almost like, you know, in. <laughs> in like paid ads where someone shows that you can't use a thing. Yes. Like it was like he was paid to prove that roller skating is impossible. Is this you? And he gets <laughs> yeah, exactly. The seat belt like, is and he's trying to make orange juice and he's yeah. covered yeah. in orange juice. Well, look, like, let's, be, let's be generous here. Toba is, I think, fine athlete. He just has one Achilles heel, which is being terrible at rollerball. <laughs> yeah, it's his only maybe. problem. It's like when there's the NBA draft and they're like, this guy has got the whole package. Can't dribble. And you're like, he can't <laughs> Yeah. Is someone yeah. gonna teach him? Yeah. <laughs> he's fucking he's got years height. Old. He's got <laughs> right. you know explosiveness. He's can't dribble. Can't, can't shoot. Can't. Yeah. <laughs> Has not heard of basketball. <laughs> he's a bruiser. Like but he's, he's got all the tools. Like <laughs> I guess then, that's Toba. the only thing we see him do is lose a fight. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. true. I mean, right. he gets sucker smacked, but, but like the, the object of the game is to throw the ball at the yes. gong. <laughs> yes. But you have to the, get the ball through the tuba, but there are two tubas. No, you have to you have to go through that to be like yes. in scoring mode. Okay. If that makes sense. That's like the Super Mario star. I don't know. That makes how, you powerful enough to score. Right. Sure. I don't know how anyone keeps track of that on like television. Yeah. Cause like in roller derby, the jammer has a star on their helmet. And so you're like, that's the jammer. I get it. Like uh-huh. that's the one. But in this is chaos. Like and they also, like, they kind of have uniforms, but they're all basically just, like, in black leather and red plastic. Once again, these sequences right? are 
incoherent visually. Which yes. I loved. <laughs> I kind of loved it too. I'm not kidding. I loved. No, Be- seriously. Because some of the characters are incredible. Yeah, you have your... You, every team has seems to have some sort of masked Cartoon costume. Character. Yeah, like yeah. Totally. person. And, and once he said... The rules are in Russian. We're not going to get into it. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm not supposed to understand this. I'm just uh, like, you are correct. Cool. Motorcycles. And there was one point where someone picked up their friend and used them to knock a guy off a motorcycle. (laughs) That stuff I was into. If I were were an extra, a background actor on the production of Rollerball, and I was playing an audience member in the stands of the Rollerball Arena, and I was watching all of this play out, I think I would be entertained. I'm not even saying in the world of the movie. I'm saying if I were watching these stunt performers do these routines from my own view, sure, I, I think I would be, be entertained. When I try to argue for the strength of John McTiernan at his best at a filmmaker, what made him such a transcendent action filmmaker, I feel like the two things that everyone goes to are unbelievable sense of visual geography. Yeah, like that his action sequences are so coherent. Yeah. And and incredible juggling of ensemble cast, right? Where you have like Predator in the jungle and you're constantly keeping track of where everyone is in relation to every tree. Or Die Hard, which is dealing with multiple floors of a building and the circuses of people outside on the street and the cops and the helicopter. And you constantly know where everyone is. You're constantly keeping track of what everyone's doing. And then you're just like, on paper, yes, John McTiernan doing rollerball sequences should be unbelievable. This is the 75 rollerball arena. It almost all plays out in master Look, shots. That looks good. That's too easy. <laughs> to be clear, it's it a circle. Looks like a it's circle. a circle. It looks like a and roller derby. here is the yes. fucking rollerball court yeah. in 2002. But like, Zach, I agree with you where like, I like the WWE <laughs> being like funneled into this. I like the costumes. I like the personas. I, I, I like the music. Totally I Totally. I wanted more of like, who are the costume guys? I, I literally would have enjoyed a two hour feed of a rollerball game. I would rather with watch no that. plot. You're um, sitting next to Jean Renault. Yes. He can occasionally basically tell you some right. stuff. But once the plot kicked in is when I started to be like, huh? But be- like, <laughs> beyond <laughs> yeah. me not uh, understanding the rules of the game and the universe of the movie, I think the way this is shot and edited, I cannot figure out what is happening in any single frame of this. No. Oh, yeah. It does not at any point seem like the teammates are working together. No. Um, they're all sort of yeah. Hello, Cool J's just on a motorcycle. Right. It's like Chris Klein gets the ball, throws it at the thing. But yeah, I don't see how anyone's helping him no. really. Yeah. No, I I don't see how the motorcycles are riding around each other and not crashing into each other. Well, all the time. it's such a they tiny do. little ring. It's very small. But this, They're very but talented. The, actors. Both sequences, movies, yes. that's what it is. Also have the plot twist of like, and now they're like no rules and the right. referee. And I'm like. There were rules before. What there rules? was a ref. Like they sort of I'm sorry, cut that moment <laughs> by having no coherent rules to begin with. Well, now it's anything goes. It seemed to be anything goes from minute zero in How this film. How is this movie spatially incoherent when it mostly takes place in a circle, in a small in an circle? Oval. Yes. Well, that's the beauty of the ball. You know what? You know what? That's the beauty of the ball. Well, you got to get your ass to Kazakhstan. You haven't seen Rollerball until you've been there. In you got to be there. You know, you've been there Fresh with like... off a shift from the mines. Right. Some yeah. kind of like aluminum tycoon is next to you lighting cigars with a $100 bill. When the yeah. food hall's great. They got a fuku. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, that's the other thing. They really upgraded on that front. They got a Shake Shack. They have a Shake Shack. <laughs> The film, it's these the four people we've mentioned. We, Jean Reno, obviously, is the yes. evil uh, boss. The greatest villain John yeah, McTiernan's the, ever put. Uh, Naveen Andrews, uh, coming off of the English patient and such, is his like smarmy assistant. I, I'd say, I think Naveen's got a little juice in this. I'm always yeah, in favor great. of him. I he's a great actor. I always like him, but I'm watching this movie take down people I usually find entertaining <laughs> left and right. And Naveen, every time he comes on screen, I'm like, I'm watching a vaguely legitimate movie for these 15 seconds. He has a clear, like, type to play. Yeah, you, you know, know like, yes. yeah. He is playing his role so well, it is not complicated, but at the yes. end, when he gives his, like, well, you don't attack the head, you always right. have to attack the arm. I'm like, yeah, this is, like, the shitty version of this movie I wanted to see when I was 13. Sure. The weaselly aid, the grima worm tongue to Jean Renault's Jacques Le Businessman, or whatever his <laughs> name is. Everyone else in the film is basically like a stuntman, a, you know, Hungarian kickboxer. Yeah. There's Andrew uh, Brynjarski. Oh. Uh, is one of the big dudes who, of course, played Leatherface. 
and uh, in the Texas Chainsaw remakes and Zangief in the Street Fighter, and the of, original Street Fighter. Of course, yeah. is the man who said cancer is worse than haters. Suck my nuts. <laughs> yeah, <he's, laughs> okay. We, we litigated agree. this in he, the he higher got, learning he, episode. He got in a feud with the original Leatherface. Uh, right. Kind of hard. Over whether cancer was worse than haters or not? Uh, I guess it was. Oh, it was, sorry. It was when Gunnar Hansen, yes. the original Leatherface, died of cancer. Right. Uh, he said, boo. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and when a fan yelled at him, he was like, could give zero fucks, suck his dead nuts. Okay. Well, he basically... And he was mad because they had feuded, I guess, as, I see. for you know, I believe the background was that he was still taking pot shots at Gunnar Nelson okay. after yeah. he died. Right. And okay. then he Earlier said, I why said, you I get agree. <laughs> you I didn't... <laughs> yeah. I think his defense was, why are you getting mad at me? Cancer is worse than haters. Okay. Okay. Right. Cancer Which is was the maybe ultimate right haters. on that front okay. <laughs> but he was maybe yeah. wrong and then you do have Paul Heyman who I feel is a well known WWE yes. figure I feel like one of the most beloved managers in the history and of... probably the best cast role in the yes. film yeah they is great did right there yes and that's an important job yeah now he maybe has the most dialogue of anyone he has a in lot the of movie. dialogue now could he have done a better job explaining what was going on maybe yes. but that's on the character I don't know. not on the performer yeah uh, you've also got Janet Wright, uh, who's a British actress, as Coach Olga, who's ever present in the film. Yes. I never really even knew if she was Chris Klein's coach or not. No, couldn't figure it but out. But she, she's always there. Yes. Going like, ah! a couple, Yeah, a couple kind of vocalizations. <laughs> Get over there! <laughs> like a lot of that. Now, we haven't talked about... So, you know, they do rollerball for a bit, and then they start to realize, like, huh, some of these accidents seem to be staged or whatever. I you did know. while watching the movie... I kept turning to my wife and saying, I think something's afoot. <laughs> because they, there were so your many. Wife watch this. <laughs> no. Okay. okay. She was into it. And for the first 30 minutes, we were both like, this is kind of fun. Right. Right. And we had looked it up and been like, oh, this is like one of the worst reviewed movies ever. <laughs> it's so and weird. we were both like, I don't know. We're enjoying it. And then she did not finish it. My wife was um, begging me to watch Rollerball. I didn't even want to watch it. She signed up. Then there is. <laughs> A sequence where they decide uh, Aurora, uh, Rebecca Romaine's character, well, is do, almost uh, killed. Sure. I want it was it, uh, Tugo? Tuba? Oh, for uh, fuck's sake. Are you you backtracking? We're forward tracking. Well, because they they fucking review the tape yes. and they realize the cameras were already in place. Someone cut his strap on his helmet. The was death staged. was orchestrated to boost the ratings or, to make it go from a 20 to a 20. Do we know he dies? Or he's Unclear. at least uh, wheeled off in a bloody mess yeah. or whatever. He's not, not with pulled. them for the rest of the season. <laughs> he doesn't come back going, I feel, yeah. I feel great. Yeah. They, they decide they need to flee the country. Mm -hmm. And a sequence plays out in night vision. This is one of the more baffling sections of, right. of LL Cool J is like, I know I staked our friendship on you coming and playing rollerball with me, but we got to stop playing rollerball right now. So I was not prepared. I had not seen this well, wait, film. Should I switch the lights off for this part please, of the please. podcast? Yes, yeah, let's do night vision record. Let's okay. also say that at this point, we've also had Chris Klein goes into, you see like a very kind of Starship Troopers, Robocop, Verhoeven-esque Oh, the men and women share the locker rooms and there's casual nudity, right? As we're saying in this R-rated version. Right, kind of Starship Troopers vibe or And whatever, then he yeah. goes into like the back room where uh, fucking Rebecca Romaine is pumping iron shirtless. Sure, we're just talking about the boobs. Okay, yes, sure. They've Five minutes for boobs. They tried to set up that they're like rivals within the league and then he comes up behind her. They immediately start doing it in a steam room. They do do it in a steam room. And he's like, you got to get me to a bed sometime. <laughs> yeah. She's like, all in good time. I'm French. Setting up. <laughs> some great payoff later. Right. Yeah. Just, and they also <laughs> earlier, they set up another character on the team was like, hey, I want to hook up with her. And Chris Klein was like, I think she's playing for the other team. Right. Yeah, he's because they're hiding their relationship herring. for some reason. There's, I don't know. There's also a, a kind rivals, of... rivals because there's storied rivals, yes. Zach, in the great sport of rollerball. There's like a Broadway Phantom of the Opera thing where she's like, I'm so disgusting. I'm, oh, I'm, oh well, this I'm a is, freak. Oh, God, because she has a scar on her face. And this is also, they're in the press. Yes. They love to do this. Yep. Where Matiernan's like, yeah, I gave her a scar. And Rebecca, like, she really reacted to how she was treated differently. She transformed. I got, you know, this is a beautiful woman. So she has a scar and people are throwing eggs at her on the street. Like or whatever. three quarters of an inch. <laughs> right. You never see it because she's always wearing a helmet. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like the fucking Broadway Phantom where it's like she's got one scar that I'm looks idiot! cool as hell. <laughs> right. And he's like, I notice the way you always tilt your head to the right. You're ashamed yes. to be seen. Yes. yes. Um, but no, yeah, he was like, <laughs> she's I, a supermodel. She didn't want to hide her looks. And I was insistent that we put a scar on her because I had to transform her as an actress. I had to get that 
bikini beach bunny out of her system. He wants to credit himself for like this transformative per uh, performance where he unlocked an actor that no one saw there. When she had been good and stuff up until this point, let's also acknowledge Austin Powers too, the spy who shagged me, in which she plays herself. She does play herself. A woman who Austin does not want to have sex with. No, yeah. well, he's too busy with um, Ivana Hump a lot in yes. that scene. Um, but then, yeah, he was like, oh, she liked the scar so much she would wear it out to the clubs at night. So they fuck and she's ashamed by how she looks and then... You know, she you eventually... set up that they have their thing. Ella Cool J comes to him and says, you got to help me escape tonight. Now, sorry, not to backtrack, but Please. there's one other thing we've missed. For some reason, there is about five to ten references to whether or not Chris Klein is wearing his spine protector, mm -hmm. which I believe yeah, is... that came up a few times. Ella <laughs> Cool J keeps being like, you need to wear that. There <laughs> yes. are motorcycles on the arena floor. And he says... They can't hurt me if they can't catch me. Um, but then he does wear it. But then, I don't know. But I think Spine Protector is maybe the only sci-fi element of I would Because it basically film. looks like, um, you know, whatever. Like a giant shin guard. Yeah. You yes. know, like that he's kind of like loosely strapped into his back or whatever. But it, yeah. it protects the spine. You know, you got to protect your, your spine. spine. It's a, yeah. right. And then... I don't think it really is ever relevant whether no. he's wearing it or not. No, this is a classic movie that sets up things where you're like, oh, wow, they're really telegraphing that hard. And then you're like, oh, no, they weren't. Right. There's no moment where he is like Tim Riggins, or not Tim Riggins. Who's the guy? Jason Street. Jason from, Street. Yeah, there's no moment where he's like, oh, damn, I wish I had that spine yeah. protector no, on. No, it like, Look, never really factors One thing in. pays off beautifully, which is that eventually Rebecca Romaine assents to uh, bringing Chris Klein to yes. a bed. Yes. And that's the moment, the moment in the movie where the movie. McTiernan is, is right. freeze frame but on. McTiernan is staring at Harry Knowles being like, why aren't you whooping and cheering at the uh, bed line, <laughs> yeah. I assume. Um, look, the night vision sequence. Yes. I had at this point begun to disassociate. Yes, this is where I started yes. to fully check out. And then this sequence plays out. Now on Wikipedia, a citation needed paragraph says that truly they had just underlit this scene and then didn't have like the time to reshoot it because it's a big, complicated action sequence. So instead, they were like, let's throw a night vision tint on it. I don't think that's true. I don't it, I don't think it is either because that sounds fucking ridiculous. It feels like a choice, but also... the It feels like a choice. The camera placement in this sequence, it's like they are dashboard. It's yes. like a mounted it camera. security footage. Right. right. Like it's all, it's not just that it's in night vision. It is filmed as if it's like stolen footage. I will say this. I think it's the one thing in the movie that is interesting and somewhat audacious. You gave this movie half a star on Letterboxd? I gave it one and a half stars. You gave it one and a half and your, your I log said I was... I gave an extra star for the night I'm, vision. Wow. I'm... I, I'm I give it one star for night vision. I think this is a half star movie I'm, without the night vision. I'm taking a star away for the night vision. Sure, but sequence. you were starting at five, right? So <laughs> right. It's a four star movie. You're yeah. only down to four and a half. Because I, you want to talk about a scene where I couldn't understand what was happening. Like now, so that's my note. Is you don't know what's happening. LL Cool J dies in this sequence. I did not really realize. Exactly. You only, yeah. it's depicted from a distance. It's like my mom watching <laughs> Force Awakens where I'm like, he's just really not in the second half of this movie. His mom famously went to the bathroom when, when Kylo Ren killed Han Solo. <laughs> and then she was like, it's weird that they just don't have Harrison <laughs> Ford do anything in the last he's 40 minutes. The last <laughs> she just thought they were keeping him on the bed. He's not even in the final scene when everyone's saying goodbye. <laughs> and also, what was that weird emotional hug that Leia did? Anyway, it's not defensible um, in terms of making a commercial film that makes sense to people. Yeah. Sure. It is just unusual. Yes, I agree. And so I was kind of like, like you said, like this is a choice. That's my thing. I'm like, none of the vi action sequences are visually coherent. This one feels almost intentionally abstract. It has the most, sure. it actually has the most like appropriate feeling of like, we are in a sort of like semi-lawless state. Yeah. Like, you know, like, Forgetting the whole, like, did John McTiernan even, like, Google Kazakhstan before he made this movie? Like, it, you, at least you're kind of like, damn, like, it really does feel like they're, like, being smuggled out of somewhere that movie, weird. the uh, Series 7, The Contenders? Yeah, of course. Right, where it's, like, a brutal sort of, like, to-the-death reality show, and it's filmed as if it's, like kind of hidden cameras. Yes, it's like a DV early Big Brother style. Right. It's right. like weirdly this is the one sequence action sequence in the movie that is not supposed to be televised and uh -huh. yet it's filmed as if it's like stolen from multi-camera setup to but, televise. But yeah, there's... But LL Cool J does die in this sequence and no one ever really acknowledges it or even 
seems that upset about it. No, and once again, I'm like, at this point in the movie, I'm like, the reveal is going to be that LL Cool J's in on it and he set up Chris Klein because they also start saying like, there's John Renault has some line at the beginning and this is sort of why McTiernan wanted to cast a Chris Klein type is he's in the boardroom with all the other fat cats and they're like, this guy's good. And they're like, he has no idea how angry we're supposed we're about to make him or something like that. Like Jean Renault's into the arc of corrupting this like goody two shoes all American boy, right? I sure. Where he's like, we're gonna break him and make him violent. There was something interesting to the sort of American obliviousness. Like, yes. you could have gotten into that in in the movie of like these two Americans show up and they're just like, yeah, this is pretty sweet. Like, There's you almost know, almost like a hostile type thing. Yeah, going on there. But yes, it feels like especially for how magically LL Cool J just appears, pulls him into a car <laughs> and says, hey, join me over in Kazakhstan. You're like, is LL Cool J getting money to like recruit like, other is this people? Like game kind of situation? Right. There at least yeah. right, be some reveal of like, yeah, he got a fat bonus because he brought over Chris Klein. Instead, it's just like, he seems to just genuinely think like, this is a great professional opportunity <laughs> yeah. for me. And then on a dime one day, he's like, I need to get out now. We gotta go. <laughs> I will say, uh, Bill Simmons, uh, uh, the famed podcast mogul, back in the day was just a sports columnist. Rollerball yes. is one of his favorite movies. The original, not this uh, film. Yes. And he wrote a column about this film. And of the night vision sequence, he said, uh, one of the strangest experience I've ever endured in a movie theater. Uh, I would say that everyone in the theater was glancing around trying to figure out what was happening, but I was only one of three people. <laughs> <laughs> his other incredible life. Which is a good line. What's the other line is really funny. I is know. Hollywood really this dumb? That's what I kept asking myself Monday as I struggled to remain conscious during a screening of the reprehensible rollerball. Just so you know, the previous sentence took nearly 20 minutes to write. I wanted to be absolutely certain that reprehensible was the best possible adjective. Simmons was in his bag back then. <laughs> so I hunted down my thesaurus buried under a phallus of magazines of pictures and searched for the perfect word to describe one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Dreadful, appalling, putrid, atrocious, heinous, execrable, <laughs> odious, abominable, rancid, horrific, ghastly. None of them fit. And then I found it reprehensible. Perfect. This movie was reprehensible. The other one I want to read is Roger Ebert's 0.5 star review. That's why I thought you gave he it. He gave it a 0. 0. 0.5. No, no, no. I gave it a 1.5. Um, I don't know what He said, someday this film may inspire a long, thoughtful book by John Wright, its editor. My guess is that something went dreadfully wrong early in the production. Maybe dysentery or mass hypnosis. <laughs> mass hypnosis. <laughs> and, and the director, John McTiernan, die hard. <laughs> a case of making someone's credit almost feel like an insult. <laughs> yes, yes. John McTiernan, parentheses, die hard, was unable to supply Wright with the shots he needed to make sense of the story. And then this is the real money. I saw a Russian documentary once where half of the shots were blurred and overexposed because the KGB attacked the negative with x-rays. Maybe this movie was put through an MRI scan. <laughs> Curiously, the signifiers have survived, but not the signified. We gotta bring this back, man. We gotta get we gotta mean on the internet Roger again. revive Roger Ebert. Well, yeah, let's bring him You're back. You're a fucking, you got a byline? Start the start throwing fucking haymakers. I just go to my editors being like, I need to take Rollerball to the cleaners. It's been too long. <laughs> This movie's 22 I mean, years old, but I'm you, ready. If you pitch, <laughs> put me in the room. If you pitch to your editors, I want to write a looking back 22 years later, rollerball stinks. Look, the 22 year anniversary is is in about three weeks. Look, it's the coming up. Time. Yeah, so it might be time. Um. So anyway, uh, yeah, El Cool J gets wasted. Uh, you know, from you know, two miles away, sure. we watch on a surveillance camera, and Chris Klein finally starts to get wise that he gets perhaps dragged back. The company wants people to get injured playing rollerball. Like something's up with that number too that goes <laughs> up and down. Should we check in with it? Something's afoot. <laughs> if you're Me paying thinks, attention, look. I watch a, a classic game of rollerball and I think normal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, me and the, six of my friends. Right. <laughs> the closer the only sport I, I watch. The more I think about rollerball, I do think there's something a little askew there, I, right? I, as a viewer of rollerball, I'm starting to wonder if the reason I watch the show is because I have an unquenchable <laughs> thirst for blood. Now, see, I'm a purist. I like the sport as it is. But once violence happens, I call my buddy. <laughs> Because they need to know, yeah. you know? Right. You like it for the tactic. I'm in for the tunnel and the ball and, right. you know. But once blood is shed, then it becomes a social activity. Oh, yeah. I'm like, everybody yeah. get over here. 
first turn on your TV so the global rating number yeah, goes up. Little, we gotta get it up. But, but come over. It let's it's watch. so funny that there's not even like a little M next to the 20. <laughs> Yeah, we Especially don't know what that. People. We don't know what units that's in. Right. Is that a share? <laughs> is that yes, a number? Nielsen? Nielsen puts one of those on every show's set. Yes, you know when they were doing Frasier back then, you know, and then Frasier would like say Sherry Niles, the number would go up, right? <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, "Yeah, good." I actually, this makes I have a logistical question about. <laughs> obviously, Chris Klein isn't in on it, mm-hmm. no. but many of the players have to be because they yeah. get a signal from the evil guys. Of like time to do violence. If it's a player who say until recently was toiling in a mine, that guy might be in on it. I'm just wondering how much, like how deep does this? Yeah. Is it 80% of the players know that we're doing WWE? I'm going to give you at least 75%. It's like mostly the Americans and like the high profile hot shots were left out. There is this feeling where it's like this movie, part of him wanting to set a present day in a less developed country, quote unquote, Right. Right is the idea of making this like analogous to like sex trafficking or something where you're like, well, in a desperate culture, people get sucked into a field with no better prospects. You know, is that line in the club early on where his big Chris Klein's big teammate is like, you make way more than me. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. And that these two Americans are actually being paid well and promoted as the faces of the sport. And everyone else is basically in like what? indentured servitude. Right. They're being paid where? With like, what money? And where do they spend it? There's the scene that almost sticks out, feels jarring because you're like, whoa, this is almost like a commentary on something where Chris Klein is like speeding in his mm-hmm. sports car. And he's like, weird, no one else on the highways. And his like assistant is like, yeah, well, no one else in this country can afford cars. Right. And you're like, oh, there's almost something here to like being big fish in a small pond, but the pond is like a third world nation and you're the only person getting to live a luxury life. Which and is, you're part of the reason why the pond is is fucked up. Which like you talking about like fucking like, you know, these these like Middle Eastern like rulers investing money into like giant American businesses while they're like citizens, you know, starve. And this weird gulf between like crazy skyscraper development and like slums. Yeah, this could have been a very interesting movie. <laughs> All the stuff is weirdly there. I looked up Kazakhstan and their favorite sport is actually soccer. Oh, okay. Not rollerball. Mm. Their second favorite sport is hockey. Mm. Okay. Uh, they would like, sport. Yeah, they would like yeah. uh, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> their third favorite sport is boxing. Okay. It's a little closer to rollerball, but that's actually popular globally. Now, something I have brought up on the podcast before is, of course, the World Nomad Games. Ooh, well, I don't, I'm not familiar. It's been around since Organized, 2014. By okay. Captain America when he had given up. It, uh, the, of course. The it grows a beard. Takes place um, in s- Central Asia. Asia. Yeah. Kazakhstan being Kazakhstan one being countries. one of the countries included. Mm-hmm. Some of the sports include horseback wrestling. Okay. okay. That is cool. Sounds fun. Belt wrestling. I'm uh, not yes. sure what that is. Do you wrestle uh, the belt or with a belt? There's a mixed uh event, okay. which includes falconry, mounted archery, and a hunt assisted by a dog. So it's, you know, it's sort of it's like taking these primitive nomadic sort of activities and then making them into and a sport. this is real? This is real. There's also a sport called, um, I believe it's called uh, Kukburu, which is like fighting for a goat carcass. Yeah. Well, hold this- on. I'm on the Wikipedia page. Founded six months ago by Ben Haas. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things where you're like, Kyrgyzstan, which is, Kazakhstan is like, fucking, you know, Singapore compared to Kyrgyzstan's Jupiter or whatever. You know, like, Kyrgyzstan is a is a rural Perfect country. analysis. I, mean, I was just trying to think of very different... Like, Kazakhstan is a, is a petro... <laughs> this is the state. hardest I've seen Ben laugh at anything in a while. <laughs> I mean, I could not have predicted what Jupiter. was... Yeah, what was I was coming. really trying to go ben, far away. Ben is... His face is fully red. Like, Kazakhstan, like, is, like, people in berets smoking. And not to insult Kyrgyzstan, it's just, like, that's a super rural David, country of farmland. Keep going. Keep going. Right? And uh, Kyrgyzstan is, like, the the most dominant, like, country by, like, so much. Yeah. Like, they're so good at the nomad games. the nomad games. games. Yeah. Gotcha. They just cry. Russia is, like, number three. Russia is, like junior compared to the Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz uh, you know, goat wrestling and all that. 
one of my uh, one of the films I've seen the most in the last few years is a film called Babies. Uh, oh. I don't know if you guys have ever heard. It's a French documentary. Uh, of course. Uh, produced by uh, Alain Chabat. Uh, yes. Uh, and it's... Is that uh, the one that's just like, it's just babies? Correct. You got it, my friend. Yeah, okay. It's like a nature documentary about four babies. I saw four that babies. opening weekend. I was so amped for that fucking movie. It's got four babies. I can... That film has no dialogue because uh, yeah. it's they just They are not babies. talking now? No. The babies? No, yeah. they're babies. Oh, well, they're like babies. I'll, ben, I'll tell you to look when they're talking. Thank it's you. from basically zero... <laughs> Yeah, to it. one year old, right. right? Like, and it's an American baby. The Mongolian baby is the one I remember popping. Exactly. Uh, uh, you, there's a Japanese baby. Yes. Uh, very cute. They're all very cute except for the American baby who you're kind of like. Pony Jiao? Uh, that's Pony Jiao, who I believe is from uh, Namibia. I just want to say you... That's a huge pull that you just got the I, name I, of the I Namibian the baby. That. I've not seen that movie since it came out. Me and my friends were so fucking amped for it. I remember Pony Zhao. Um, yes, and the uh, Mongolian baby. Uh, Who, I just remember... That Mongolian baby is like a nomad a game-ass baby. He's yeah. just climbing up like rusty buckets and like, you yeah. know, like poking a yak this, and all that. This movie actually rules. Yes, uh, babies. I'd forgotten yes. about it. Just check it out. I watch it with my kid all the time because my kid likes... No, it makes sense. There are babies. I remember the, the yes. trailer was set to... Um, uh, it was also like kind of a big hit because it translated in every country. Yep. Yep. It's got oh, no yeah. speaking. Uh, and no narration or anything. You're nope. just watching Slice of Life. But you're watching babies. like parallel development. Like he'll yes. just cut between like now they're all kind of learning to do this. Like and yeah. you just see the different ways they're learning to do that. It's cool. It's a good movie. I like Babies. Babies yeah. is good. I remember there's a part in the trailer which is set to some Sufjan Stevens song yep, sure. where it intercuts. It cuts between all four babies like crawling and then in big letters it just says the babies are coming. <laughs> <laughs> good movie. And I, I, I turned to my friend like Emily St. James's dad and went, I'm seeing that. Uh, ben, should we get you to cover the next World Nomad Games? Absolutely. Fly out to, well, let's see. Man on the Beat? Uh-oh. I was going to say, where, where, the next one is. where is it happening? Kazakhstan. Oh, fuck. Now that's in September. Is that what you were teeing up in? Yeah. September uh, wow. 8th to 15th. Yes. In Astana, which is the uh, capital of Kazakhstan. And, uh, pretty easy to fly to, I think. We can Might probably. Oh, yeah. Maybe probably one layover. Maybe a layover in Istanbul or something. It won't yeah. be so bad. Yeah. We could yeah. probably get you press accreditation through this podcast. Any editors that listen to the show, I don't know, afar, uh, I'm trying to think of some travel publications. You have been saying, Ben, it's been too long since we've done a quote-unquote documentary episode, right, right. like going to Six Flags or Atlantic City. And every year you pitch, like, is there a fun place we could go to and record? Well, my friend, maybe it's time for you to tape a Zoom recorder to your chest and fly solo to Kazakhstan. <laughs> And bed yourself in the nomad game. They also play like Mancala, you know, that like board game. Like they it's like they both play these crazy physical things. It's and an interesting mix. These like ancient board games. But and, do you like, have to play like Mancala on the back of a bull? Yeah. <laughs> they strap you to a donkey. Is it like the Olympics where you don't compete in every event, or is it like no, everyone's got to all you, I, you all gain I can tell points? You is that and there's Kyrgyzstan like one has winner, eighty-one gold medals. Okay, so wow. and Kazakhstan has forty. Okay. Like that's that's a huge drop. That sounds Mongolia's sounds got three gold medals in its history. Okay, just to shout out the Mongolian baby. Uh, U.S. Who I'm sure is now zero a golds. Have they sent anyone to the uh, Nomad Games? Uh, I'm seeing here they have. Yes, because we have three silvers, <gasps> four bronze. All right. Good for us. I want to watch Babies again. I forgot this existed. Dude, now, I own it on I iTunes. Think Throw maybe it up. We yeah. take Babies. Uh oh. We set it in another country. <laughs> maybe like a Central Asian yeah. sort of post Soviet. Yeah. We add some motorcycles. <laughs> Just uh -huh. a little bit of rollerball. <laughs> we do even less dialogue explaining what's happening. Rollerball you Babies. Know, I think yeah. I agree with you. Like, what if the film was just like opening credits? Rollerball is about to begin. Yeah. And we just watch Which, this. By the way, game. how the Rollerball original is coming. I yes. want to, I want to restate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, yes. No, the Jewish in film does that. Yeah, but then of course the Jewish in film goes into the back. No, it then gets like, into a more interesting story. But the first ten minutes are just no. give me noises off. Yes, give me rollerball the whole game, and then you can show me what's happening behind the scenes during the game. I'm just imagining sure. David. I'm in the pitch room. as an exec at MGM watching the first cut of rollerball and going, John, John, 
Give me noises <laughs> off. You seen noises off? Seen the, the deaf Broadway comedy Act noises one, off? On stage. Act two, backstage. That's Katie what... Finneran, you know from her, John? Oh, man. One a Tony. Do you know what else I think this movie was missing? What? I think it was missing the sports movie style uh, end credits little paragraphs that tell you what the players are up oh, to now. A hundred percent. Like, movie. tell me what happened to the assassin yeah, or whatever. Leads. Yes. For, For real, I was like, I, yeah. that would have felt so right in the moment to just see like, the Black Widow or whatever yeah. is right. now, Tuba you know. Tuba or whatever his name yeah. is. What happened to that T guy? Tuba, reco Tuba recovered and is, you know, now, uh, unfortunately, back working in the mines yeah, or whatever. Like, yeah, right. Some of them, it's like mines, mines, mines. This guy's coaching mines. That's another, I mean, you, you brought up that the the killer, hilarious ending of this film is Rebecca Romaine, James Bond style, saying, how about we get you to a bed? Yeah, right. Freeze frame on Chris Klein basically going, whoa. <laughs> like yes. a reaction shot pulled straight He's from Sadism. He's sex with her, to be clear. Yeah. Like, it's not a like, lot of times it yeah. seems. Yes. By the way, but not an event. Like, it's always on the cold hard steel yeah. of the sauna room. Or I think in theatrical version, the sex scenes basically cut out. Yes, and uh, her her quote unquote nudity is so thoroughly obscured by shadow and steam, where you can yes. see nothing. Night vision. They put on the night vision. <laughs> they yeah. snap it on it. <laughs> then in the R rated cut, now you can see her naked, but there is still a lot of shadow. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Apparently, when they filmed it, it was just like crazy full frontal. They screened it that way. The sex scene was far more explicit. Sure. It is insane in 2002 to be like, we have footage of Rebecca Romaine so naked. We have to get this far away from viewers. Well, we'll <laughs> save it for the DVD. No, we're going to kind of cloud it in the DVD as well. But apparently th the ending, even though McTiernan didn't get to shoot his full Spartacus thing, it sounds like at some point the intention of the ending was supposed to be that like they feel like they've won. They've beaten the game. Yeah. He shot John Renault and Naveen Andrews. They right. win. And then the sort of like ominous. I didn't he kill John Renault with a table? You're right. Yeah, he tables. <laughs> he tables him. Okay. <laughs> tables his ass. And he should he should have said, let's table this discussion for <laughs> right. a later time. Right. But um that that the ominous note at the end of the movie after that joke was supposed to be like, oh, but him turning on the execs and Just killing the them. Violent up the ratings yeah. and has now legitimized Numbers. rollerball as a sport. That's more interesting. I like wow. that. Right. That it's like they kind of like won the battle, lost the war. Right. Rollerball is too big to be stopped. Yes. Yes. It's kind of a good ending. You guys are idiots. Stop no, thinking wrong. rollerball can be fixed. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What if we add a third level, David? <laughs> good. <laughs> 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 we didn't really talk about the final sequence where Chris Klein uh, skates out of the rink, kicks through the glass, and then most of that is in slow motion for some reason. They try to make it like Chris Klein is having this Mandy-esque breakdown where it's like now he's covered in blood and he's lost his mind. They finally broken this guy, which was, that was McTiernan's intent in casting him. Is like, if you start out with this guy right. being so yeah. goofy and guileless. Apple pie fella is sure. now, right, yeah. He's he's kind of the dark side, yeah. Where's Wait. this uh, line? But Instead, sorry. he has like a black eye and he's got like some goo on his face. Yeah, Chris was perfect for rollerball because he's an absolute straightforward American boy without an agenda or a cool bone in his body. You rarely hear directors say that about the Again, leading men Chris Klein's sitting next to him. they hired for their own oh, action movies. Cool. And then he said he's as earnest as Jimmy Stewart. Another weird comparison for a sci-fi action movie. So that when he finally gets angry, you believe it. He's right in an abstract sense that if that worked, it would be very satisfying sure. and disturbing. I didn't even really feel like he was that angry. No, he's not. I felt like it was just kind of like... Well, here's here's the next step of the of what I got to yep. do, you know. He's doing okay, right? He was on um The Flash, Chris Klein for a season. What did he play? Uh, he played a villain, but like a big villain. Uh, it was with a really embarrassing name. Let me look it up. Okay, I I want only the best for him. <laughs> Wait a second. What? This is crazy. His okay. villain name was Cicada. Okay, <laughs> which. Zach That's mentioned cicadas. That's pretty fun. That's pretty good. Uh, and he's currently on the Netflix show uh, Sweet Magnolias. Okay. Uh, which is one of those shows where you're like, well, that doesn't exist, does it? It's like, no. what do you mean? Three seasons worth. Like, the biggest show in America. So he's making, he's he's okay. I just want to be making a living, you I, know? Let's also call out the other thing is 
you know, he hits very quickly, right? Election, American Pie, yeah. probably best comedic performance of the 1990s in American Pie is Oz, a character we all love. Sure. Uh huh. Then starts dating Katie Holmes. Yes. And they're yeah, kind of this like yeah. a teeny bopper power couple where it's like, holy shit, the guy from American Pie is dating the girl from Dawson's Creek. Shortly after this movie, they are engaged to be married and then she dumps him for Tom Cruise. It is so bizarre to jump from Chris Klein to Tom Cruise. It's kind of like a Kyrgyzstan to Kazakhstan type <laughs> disparity. It's like being so close to the NHL and then yeah. <laughs> signing up for murder ball. Yeah. I've always liked um, the flag of Kyrgyzstan because it has a um, a yurt on it. Uh huh. Uh, it's a red flag with a yellow yurt in like a sunburst. I'm a big flag nerd. Okay. Uh, and my friend uh, went to Kyrgyzstan uh, mm -hmm. and recently he mailed me a flag because he knew I was such a Kyrgyzstan wow. flag. Wow. Yep. Uh, my friend went to Kyrgyzstan because uh, Russia, where he lived, declared war on Ukraine. I don't know if you heard about this. And he took the only flight he could out of Russia, which was to Kyrgyzstan. Wow. Um, should great we do the box office game? Not a fun reason for getting not a, a great fun gift. reason. But you know what? He got out of there. He yeah. got out of there. He hopped, uh, you know, he hopped all the way over. Is there anything else in the dossier? No, no. We did the dossier. <laughs> I, pro I promise. I looked. I promise. Um, Griffin, this was, a, this was an interesting week. I, I do know, I don't think, I don't know if it was number one at the box office, but it was mentioned in the dossier. It was spoiled for me. One of the movies that opened against it because part of the lawsuit where Universal sued MGM for using Fast and Furious is that they claimed they were deliberately trying to sabotage Universal's big release that same weekend. Which was? Big Fat Liar. Big Fat Liar. A movie that, it's one of those things where I, I all of us in this room, a little bit too old for that movie, right? I saw and loved it. I'm not saying I didn't see it, but I feel like when I talk to people who are like four to five years younger than us, that movie is so totemic. Yeah, so I'm 25. Yeah, you're 25. I forgot you're 15. My, my friend Claire, who is similarly like in her late 20s, yeah. Her letterbox review for the holdovers was move over big fat liar. There's a there's the best best new Paul Giamatti performance just dropped. This is the thing. Like the amount of Paul Giamatti memes that have been circulating I post holdovers seen, yeah. feel very tied to people really feeling connected to Giamatti and Big, big Fat Liar Liar when they were a child. And then he was on his incredible episode of WTF. I haven't listened to that yet. But he's, he's also obviously doing those like YouTube, uh, you know, talks about his whole career, talks right. about being an orangutan. So it's been like, coming you know. up a lot, but it's one of those things where it went from being like, isn't this funny that Paul Giamatti, a couple of years away from being accepted as one of our finest actors, the Zach Cherry of got his painted, moment. Got painted blue <laughs> yeah. by Frankie right. Nudes was in and this Amanda like Bynes. silly kids movie. R right. And he's like, I've accepted that's like kind of one of the totemic works of my career and is like one of the things that will be on my tombstone. And he talks about like in the WTF episode where he's like, I'm starting to come to terms with the fact that like I occupy a weird place in like a generation psyche. Now, I haven't I'm going to confess I haven't seen Big Fat Liar. I was too old for it. Uh, I was 16 years old, like I said, or, you know, about to be. Sure. Uh, yeah, is it, it must good? have been like one, one or two when it came out. <laughs> right. I forgot. Zach is five. <laughs> <laughs> is it good? Our youngest act. I remember it being fun. You know, it's like a kid. It's like a kids. Yeah, get, get up to shenanigans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. first Sean yeah. Levy movie. Yep. the man who now, of course, is our modern Spielberg. Right, and it was written by Dan Schneider. Normal. Normal. Uh, I see here that it's based on Aesop's Fable. <laughs> what? Is that it's true? Technically based on the boy who cried wolf. Okay. Oh yeah, I guess. My memory of it, it's like you know, Munez and Bynes are really big at that Giamatti's moment. character is yes. called Marty Wolf. Okay, that makes sense. Ah, wow. He, and he plays. He's you know, like, the big fat liar. He's a blowhard Hollywood uh, deal maker. He, I can't remember if he's a producer. Or he's, he's supposed to be producer. an exec. He's a yeah, yeah. And and he gets the better of them, and they proceed to prank him for like you know ninety minutes or whatever. It's kind of classic Ben cinema bushwhacked. Home Alone, where Giamatti is in the Daniel Stern position of being tortured and embarrassed in any number of ways. And I just remember watching it on cable some point years later and being like, yeah, Giamatti's giving this a lot. It is undeniably funny to watch these things happen to Paul Giamatti. Um, we got to get him in a Home Alone now that, now that I think of it. How about you reboot Paul Giamatti, but he's the one stuck in the Home Alone? Ooh, yeah. And it's a bunch of kids trying to break in. Yeah. So it's just <laughs> Paul Giamatti like drop kicking seven yeah, year olds. Yeah. Violence to kids. All yes. right. That is, might be good. That is my pitch. 
think there's an opportunity. with these kids. So this is February 8th, 2002. Why, why Paul Giamatti is Regis. But. To be clear, Big Fat Liar is opening to a healthy 11.5 million at number two. Though. Okay. So what is number one? It is a delayed film. It was supposed to come out it's on 9-11. Delayed. Yes. It was a 9-11 It was delayed delay. because uh, it's a, you know, a, the, the character's fighting terrorists, I think. It's not uh, like a film. Collateral movie. damage. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger in collateral damage. I mean, that's an interesting, you could do sort of screening series of the 9-11 affected movies. Yes. And it's Zoolander. Yes. Although that one did come out. It did come out. Yes. Donnie Darko. Big, uh, big Trouble. Big Trouble. Big Trouble is the one where they're like, oh shit, a plane gets hijacked in our movie that has nothing to do with, you know, uh, terrorism. That's the third act is a, a couple dumb it's Tom Sizemore and Johnny Knoxville bring a bomb on a plane and yeah. try to hold it hostage. Um, the other insane one, but they somehow Spider -Man, fixed right. it. Spider-Man Spider -Man was they, only the trailer. They had to reshoot, or, mm. you know, they had to get rid of the Because the, the trailer, trailer was all stuff that was shot just for the trailer, oh, not okay. by Sam Raimi. Um, uh, the one that's interesting is Lilo and Stitch. Why? Uh, does Lilo do The last act that of the movie was supposed to be Hitch hijacks a plane and starts flying it at a low Stitch. altitude not over. Hitch. Stitch. You said hitch. I said I said <laughs> stitch with uh, my voice was <laughs> caught so in my excited. throat. Yes. Stitch Is hijacks. Real? Yes. Stitch hijacks a plane and flies at a low altitude over Hawaii through the city and people are freaking out. Right, right. And they had animated it that way, but had right. not. And then he goes totally to the finished. Pentagon. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are freaking out that the like the airplane he's supposed to be on a commercial airliner that he's hijacked. Yeah, I understand. And they freaked out and they were like this is like 15 minutes of the movie. The whole third act is built around this. We've animated it. We can't start over and make our release date. And some fucking genius who better have gotten the greatest bonus was like, make it a spaceship. Right. There you go. Problem and they solved. like reanimated over only the vehicle and cut like two lines of dialogue out and made it that the bad guy lands with his spaceship and Stitch hijacks it. And when it's a spaceship, no one gives a shit. Very true. Um, so in the original version, the bad guy was just landing on a commercial. <laughs> like I think in the original version, Stitch is chasing another spaceship with a plane. And in this one, somehow he gets his hands on a different spaceship or something. But you can watch online the version of it with the plane that's like half finished. It's have bizarre. you seen Collateral Damage? I never have. Neither I have think I. I. I think that's the one where he's like a firefighter. Yes, yes. but it turns out to yeah. be an inside job. He is a... <laughs> I'm not kidding. I he's think a, that's he's a firefighter fire fi who sets charges. <laughs> right. Um, I think that's truly why the movie got delayed. Some is that steel beams? He's a fireman, but there's some conspiracy. I don't uh, remember. He, no, it's that. like his family dies. Yes, a masked man called El Lobo, the wolf, uh -huh. uh, claims responsibility and says that he is uh, in Colombia. Okay, and so uh, because of the red tape. Uh, so annoying when there's red tape. Yeah. Uh, he and of course he's called Gordy Brewer, real sure. Schwarzenegger name. I'm Gordy Brewer. I'm a, American. I'm a blue collar. I'm Irish. I passed the firefighter exam. <laughs> uh, -huh. uh, he just goes to Columbia himself and you know throws people into trees or I don't know what he's what he, he does. throws a fire axe at them. That's like uh, that's it's an Andrew Davis movie, which yeah. is the reason I've always wanted to Same. see it, uh, but I've never seen. Do you it. think John McTiernan's like looking across the aisle and being like, "If I had just made that movie, yeah, that stuff. movie, I mean, because like that movie was not like successful, yeah. but it did well. It was pretty, it actually, did pretty badly. Collateral damage, but it made more than Rollerball. Yeah, and you know what else happened? Andrew Davis didn't go to prison. <laughs> well, you know. It all comes out in the wash, right? That's true. Uh, Rollerball is opening at number three to nine million dollars. It will end up at 18. So it has a two multiplier. Bad. Not very good. Number four at the box office is a, a big hit. It, it's total domestic haul was 18. Correct. 18 mil. And it cost over 100. Yeah. And like, that's not even, I, I, I there's nothing here telling me what the global um, rating was, though. I don't know what right. that number is. Yeah, how did it do in yeah. Kazakhstan? <laughs> Well, it probably it probably made like <laughs> one or two there. for the first ten minutes, right? And then as soon as the violence started, it Spiked got up, up to eighteen. Yeah, yeah. It went up to <laughs> you know how sometimes like <laughs> they were adjusting how many millions of dollars it was making in real yeah, time. Track There's real like time. an Italian villain, and, and but then minute. you learn like, oh, in Italy, that villain's actually Portuguese. Like, right? Like they uh, right? What is that the thing? Like in Kazakhstan, they're actually like, yeah, we're going to Uzbekistan. Like they like just <laughs> like. <laughs> I don't like know. It's like in Toy Story 3. Oh my God. Here where there's goes. the bit, I'm sorry, but you teed it up. I didn't tee anything there's up. There's the my bit in Toy Story 3 where they reset Buzz and he becomes Spanish Buzz, right? Yes, yes. yes. 
And the question was, how do we translate this joke to Spain? Right. And they made it hyper regional. Right. They made, he's like uh, Basque buzz or something. Yes. They or made just... it like a specific dialect where it's like, we all agree this type of Spaniard is silly. Uh, number four at the box office, Griff. It's a big hit uh, from a, you know, sort of leftover from Oscar season. It's a war film. It's a war film. It's a Black Hark Black Hark Dan. Black Herc Dan. Black Herc Dan. Uh, a in my opinion, a, a very good movie. Um, one of the simsiest movies. Yeah. Of the twentieth century. You seen Black Hawk Down? Ridley Scott's Black oh, Hawk yeah, Down. Oh yeah, I used to love century. Black Hawk Down. Yeah, obviously, you know, somewhat problematic movie for some people. I think that's the point of the movie, but mm -hmm. it's an argument to be had because obviously the movie is about them shooting Somalians, essentially. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Um, I think it's about, you know, how war turns us into like video game characters, basically. But but it's you know. certainly of an era yes. of war movies that didn't necessarily interrogate that, you know. I think the interrogation has to happen with you yeah. mostly because Ridley yeah. Scott's whole thing is like, it's as real as it fucking gets, mate. Even though, of course, my other favorite thing about Black Hawk Down is like 90% of the actors are British. Yes. Where it's like all these Americans being like, yeehaw, let's go get them, boys. And I'm just like British, 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 Australian. British. Right? Irish. A couple Australians. And then Josh Hart and it's like, hey. Scottish. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, in the defense Josh Hartnett was about as American as you could get at that moment 100%. Josh Hartnett by the way he looks like a, a jarhead uh, and yeah. also yeah. is like who McTiernan should have hired for rollerball yeah right yeah, if sure. you're looking in that age range you know what I kept thinking mm -hmm. I want to see this with Keanu I mean I that just sounds like a good movie yeah I mean, make that now. Yeah. Keanu would probably have to play the Jean Reno now, or he could be like the aging yeah. vet, like the who's coach, like, the I, trainer. you know, yeah, I used yeah. to be the king of rollerball, but it ruined me. Or he just could like be, one he last could be an ball. NHL superstar who like can't hack it anymore in the NHL. Well, you know what I was thinking? Because you got to bring the NHL in. That's the main part. M Michael B. Jordan, yeah. very aligned with MGM, right? Because they yeah. do the Creed movies with him. Yeah, when he did uh, Without Remorse. Correct. Them, yeah. uh, now, now uh, MGM Amazon. and Amazon company or whatever. He, for the last 10 years, since Creed hit, about 10 years now, has been trying to remake Thomas Crown Affair, a movie they claim is maybe close to actually happening. I'm like, if you're going to remake a McTiernan Jewison movie, Michael B. Jordan would work well in a rollerball. I think he's got to do both. He's so athletic and he's so angry. I'm not opposed. Right? The only reason I think people won't remake Rollerball is this film. Yes. Uh, which is not only terrible, but someone went to jail. What if they called it Baller Rolls and pretended it was original? <laughs> that sounds bad. That sounds like a spinoff of the HBO show Ballers. Number five at the box office is a family film, Griffin. It's not Big Fat Liar. No. Remake from Rollerball with Paul Giamatti as the ball. Yes. And the ball is blue. Uh, it's from Disney. It's 2002. It's a family film. It's live action or it's animated? Live action. It's a live action family film from 2002. Stars an Oscar winner. Stars an Oscar winner in the lead role? The lead role. This film is called Snow Dogs. It stars Cuba Gooding Jr. and James Coburn. Uh, it stars two Oscar winners. No, above obviously, the title. Uh, Zach, you were born on the day this film came out, but uh, did you see it in theaters? My, uh, yeah, I think that was one of the first movies. I, I went straight from the hospital. <laughs> Your mom you were actually you. born during a screening actually, of Snow Dogs. I actually don't know if I ever saw that. I remember it being so present as an idea. Yeah. Like, I feel like the trailer was everywhere. Get ready for Mush Hour. Yeah. But no, <laughs> I don't know if line. I saw that one. I did learn. I learned to speak from watching the trailer. Though. Did that tagline win the Pulitzer that, Prize? That tagline is in the Library of Congress. Yes, the rest of the film wasn't let in. They, they kept um, it out. I definitely. No, my favorite thing is that the billing on that film for children about a bunch of huskies doing what do they do? They raise. Uh, is Cuba Gooding Jr. and James Cooper right, two Oscar winners <laughs> above the title? Do you know who just imagine a seven year movie? Like, hey, Coburn's in this one. Coburn, I'm gonna see it. That movie's a two hander. Coburn is all over it. Do you know who Coburn plays? Uh, I don't. Cuba's father. Interesting. Two okay. very similar men mm -hmm. with identical energies. Cool. Hey, I'm Cuba uh, Jr. Looks like Cisco. James Cisco's Coburn. also in this film. Cisco, yes, because I think at the beginning of the movie, Cuba's a dentist. Yeah, and he's Cisco's playing, his uh, dental hygienist. Dr. Rupert Brooks. And then he's like, we've discovered your long lost father. Here's your lineage. You've inherited a bunch of dogs, but also your dad's still alive and you need to race together. I think, I think that's what the movie is. 
That movie is paired with <laughs> Kangaroo Jack, which does the same thing a year later, and both movies do it to pretty wild success, or both hits. Yes, yeah, Snow Dogs did did fine, eighty one mil. There's domestic. Snow Dog Racing and Kangaroo Jack. Kangaroo Jack and Snow Dogs both do the same thing, where the trailers feature a bunch of footage of the animals talking and saying funny things, and you're like, "Oh, this is a funny talking animal movie." And then you see it. And in both movies, there is one scene where the human being is knocked out and has a nightmare where the animals talk to them. Right. Otherwise, oh. they don't talk. Right. right. So Snow Dogs now, has so the a scene where it was avoided because they do talk. It was the avoided. Film. Right. But like Snow Dogs has a scene where Cuba Gooding Jr. is like concussed and then he sees all the Snow Dogs like sitting in like Barca loungers and they're like, these humans are silly, huh? And they're like toasting cocktails. And I remember seeing the trailer at some movie with Romley, my little sister at that point is five and she's like, gotta see that and then we right. sit there the whole time she's like when are the dog's gonna talk yeah and kangaroo jack same thing the trailer was all him rapping that's one nightmare sequence that jerry o'connell has see this is why that the ana de armas fans have a point and in my opinion a case i think it's self-afflicted sure. what if you suddenly i like check your socials and i'm like zach's tweeting a lot about ana de armas <laughs> It's just like a picture of her like getting Dunkin' Donuts and you're like, looking good, queen. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, Zach made some bad real estate investments and he needs to be rewarded $5 million in the yesterday case now. Uh, also in the top 10, uh, you've got The Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the pretty robust Kevin Reynolds. I, I like that movie. Caviezel and Pierce. Yeah. Just a fun, old fashioned sure. sword movie. It's uh, you got A Beautiful Mind, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. A big hit. Big hit? Huge hit. I yeah. just want you to note the pause I took of self-restraint. Good job, buddy. Thank you. Uh, number eight, A Walk to Remember, uh, the Mandy Moore Shane West. Yes. Uh, For a second, I thought Chris cancer. Klein was in that, but Chris Klein was in a different... He's in a different one. Sparksian-esque yeah, who can romantic that? drama. Uh, number this side nine. of heaven or something hmm, like that. I think Ben's about to perk up because mm -hmm. this is a film about some prophecies involving the Mothman. <laughs> A film, uh, a film Ben has pitched no less than five times for an episode. I think we have to do it on Ben's choice. That yeah. is it becoming, would be delightful. It would. Delightful is the first word I think of <laughs> when, when the Mothman prophecies are. <laughs> like when that film starts, it's like Richard Gere and Laura Linney, right? right? Like it's like a, you know, pretty, you know, kind of Tony Yeah. And they're like, yeah, have you ever heard of the Mothman? And I'm just like leaning forward, like the Mothman. And Ben's like, yelling, Mothman, <laughs> Mothman. Mothman. Uh, number 10, I Am Sam. Maybe one of the more misguided films ever made. Yeah. Yeah. That movie was, I believe, written and directed. I Am Sam? Yes. Okay. By Molly Gordon's mother. Jesse Nelson? Yes. Okay. Yep, you're right. Who also... Married to Brian Gordon, another correct. director. Who was a big TV director, I yeah. want to say. Yeah. But she also originated... I, I went down a rabbit hole of watching uh, bad holiday movies over the holiday season, ones I hadn't seen before. Right. That I she had also avoided. She directed uh, Karina Karina, which is a pretty, Karina, pretty good movie. That's a pretty solid movie. Yeah. Uh, she originated the premise for Fred Claus because it started out as a bedtime story. She told now star Molly Gordon. Wow. And in Fred Claus, Molly Gordon is name checked. There's a scene where oh, Fred Claus like, has. Who's being good or bad or whatever. Right. And he's like, oh, okay, let's get a bike for Molly Gordon. Well, another movie with the big fat liar himself. Giamatti he slays in that thing, right? He, he, he slays. Ho, ho, ho. He slays in the sleigh in that thing. <laughs> I think, Slays the thing with bells on. Can I just yeah, list sleigh bells? That movie features Academy Award nominee, perhaps winner by the time this episode comes out. It could happen. Paul Giamatti, Academy Award nominee Miranda Richardson, absolutely. Academy Award winner Kathy Bates. Yep. Academy Award winner Rachel Weisz. We're get we're getting to a, a but. But <laughs> two time Academy Award winner Kevin Spacey. Yeah. That thing is like fucking loaded. It was the, That's Fred Claus. Fred Claus. It was Claus. the follow up uh, to Wedding Crashers, right? For David Dobkin. Yes. It was, he, had, he had the juice. It's a blank check movie. Never seen. Have you seen Fred Claus? I know you were like negative two when that came out. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch Fred Claus. That, that movie <laughs> is a nightmare. Yeah, you're not a fan. Right. No, it's a it's a night. It, it's the weirdest combination of like, isn't it time to give Vince Vaughn his elf? Like that was clearly uh -huh. the calculation. Right. Jesse Nelson had written that script. It sit around for a while, sat around for a while, and Vince Vaughn. They were like, we'll pay you twenty million dollars. You reteam with the Wedding Crashers guy. Bring your edgy rat a tat 
<laughs> dialogue style. Leather yeah, jacket right. fucking asshole energy. To this heartwarming <laughs> family. <laughs> but they're really trying to go for like, this is a Santa Claus. This is his elf. It's going to start out a little nasty and it's going to win you over with charm. And the style is so incompatible. They also like 90% of the elves in the movie are played by little people. But then John Michael Higgins is also like ludicrous. Ludicrous. There are a couple big actors who they do tiny face replacement on. Oh, boy. And the effect is not there. Yeah. Also, Elizabeth Banks is also an elf, but she's just regular size. She's normal size. And John Michael Higgins wants a piece. And a lot of the movie is Fred Claus trying to teach him how to be more of an aloof asshole so she falls for him. I have seen that. <laughs> You're like, it's wait, that I remember laughing at. So strange. <laughs> okay. Well, it received negative reviews I'm seeing here. But why are we even talking about it? Because that didn't come out. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Justin no. Nelson, director of I Am Sam. Yeah, right. And I Am Sam, I am Sam was that Dakota Fanning's? Uh, yeah. Yes, that's the Pop. film where Sean Penn is a sort of right. intellectually disabled person, although they don't really get into it. Who's also a single father. Who is also a single father to an adorable child. Played and by she's Elf, now uh, Dakota reaching the age where her mental capacity is exceeding his, and it becomes a custody yes. battle and, with and, the state. And she is genuinely like astonishing in it. Like yeah. everything else about the movie is god awful. Right. And she's so natural she got a and SAG cute, nomination. Right. That she almost got an Oscar nomination. And instead they gave Sean Penn an Oscar nomination. Yeah, which is illegal. I mean it's <laughs> which is illegal. It literally becomes the uh Tropic Thunder bit. Right. Yes. Right. It's the the backbone of the Tropic Thunder bit. <laughs> yes. Uh I have heard uh, Elle Fanning plays baby Dakota yep. in that movie. I have heard their voices so much over the past week because I had COVID. My entire family had COVID. My daughter is obsessed with I My Neighbor Totoro. Oh. Which is just Dakota, the English dub of the most recent Wow. Dub. It's just Dakota and Elle At that the age, whole time. But like, it must have been right around that time, They're right? kids. Yeah. They're both kids. And okay. they're both very good in it. Yeah. I mean, it's a totally well-executed dub. she's obsessed with Equalizer 3. And she's just fucking obsessed with Equalizer 3 and Hulu's yeah. the great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Playing them on split screen. <laughs> yes. No, just every Every, every, you know, six hours. Totoro, I won't watch Totoro. And I'm like, all right. Dakota kind of eats an Equalizer 3. Right? Yeah. You finally uh, watched Equalizer it. Equalizer 3 rocks. <laughs> Equalizer yeah. 3 is great. so good. And yeah. the fact that it is a Denzel, Dakota, Man on yes. Fire reunion is like sweet. And also, then you're like, ah, oh, they're not really doing enough with it. And then the ending kind of gets you back. You're like, yeah. I'm not going to spoil it for the listener, but I told you this and you were skeptical. The, the twist kind of gets you. The twist is good. The, the, the closing. You feel silly for not seeing it coming. But did you see that every one of those movies they make for like 75 million and they make like 250 million? Clockwork. Look. And we're definitely going to get another one. Look, better. Yeah, but it hurts. I will. I, I want to tell you something, Zach, and then we should wrap the episode. Okay. And I know you couldn't see Equalizer 1 and 2 in theaters because you were too young. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I only just was allowed to start watching those. <laughs> so the Equalizer uh, made $101 million domestically, just in America. On release. Uh, and how much did it open to, David? Uh, that's a great question. It's also important to what you're about to say. Uh, it open, its opening weekend was $34 million. Okay. 34 101 Equalizer 2. The Equalizer 2 made $102 uh -huh. million. Dollars. It, the, it, it opened to? Uh, 36 mil. Okay. Okay. Hey. Just like the fact that this is a character so committed to equals. Equal. Yeah. <laughs> That he's like, if I make a two, we add one dollar to yep. the total, essentially. Now here's what's frustrating. Equalizer 3 opens to? $34 million. Basically, the same opening as all the others. It splits the difference between the two. It made 92. It I just sucks. needed to make an extra $9 million. They need to re-release that thing in IMAX now. They need to re-release it on 40,000 screens so that people are just fooled into buying tickets They need somehow. to promise everyone who goes to see it that they will be refunded $100. <laughs> Just so we can get this thing right. it's to about 103. The, the revenue. It's fine yes. if you, you know, it's fine if you pay it back. Because I need Equalizer 4 to happen. They, I agree. He needs to die making these movies. He needs to make them for four more decades. I think he wants to. I think he's basically the, the only, only thing. sequel he's ever made, right? Yes. yes. And now he's made three of them. I think he's like kind of the only thing holding society together at this point. Robert McCall. This man is so good at fucking equalizing I shit. Just, especially in Equalizer 3, he's like, he's living in a small Italian town. But this is... And it's truly like, it feels like he's like, yeah, Home Depot. 
that was pretty good. Yeah. Right. Being friends with Orson Bean or whatever Equalizer 2 was about. That yeah. was pretty good. Great. This is the most equal way of life. Yeah. Like living in this town where I go, like, go get my fish. And this is oh, my yeah. whole selling go point to you. Go talk to the lady making coffee. Once I finally got equal pilled and I was trying to sell you on these movies, David, I'm like, each one of them features 40 minutes of just Denzel, even Vibes. keeled, daily routine. Just trying Chill. to go about his and, day. And the third one just nails the formula because you're like, you know what this guy does? He has a nice espresso every right. afternoon. He talks to the coffee lady and then some guy comes in and he's like, I am a gangster. And I'm like, if Denzel doesn't rip this guy's throat out right away, I'm going to be so mad. This guy's got to die. I will How dare he spoil the vibe? The third equalizer. Robert McCall becomes so violent yeah. that he may be becoming the monster. Um, well, may, this is interesting territory for so equalizer, equalizer 4. four. Yeah. He's unequal. He I think that would be interesting out. to explore yeah. because... He no longer he 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 starts really working out some issues with with, he does. with his um no but this look this man he's experienced a lot of tragedy That's right true. I think there's some unresolved emotional issues with oh, him big time he's looking for a sense of peace he cannot yeah. find it or equality right well <laughs> this man he demands equality yeah. I wish I do feel like they lose the watch thing. Yeah. I like the watch thing that this feeling that he's like Steven Soderbergh where he's like I'm in competition with myself I'm trying to equalize things faster than I did last time. But he's a little older. Maybe, you know, maybe he's... He's, he's shuffling a yeah. little more. He's shuffling. How old is Denzel now? Uh, 70? 69? He Eight. is 69, my friend. I don't forget nice. an age like that. Um, <laughs> I was trying to be polite, so I said 70. Yeah, no, no, man. My, my dude is partying this year. <laughs> he's trying out some different orientations of his body. We're done. Can I just say one last thing? Because you brought up Dakota and Al Fanning. Do you know they were making an adaptation of, I think it was going to be called The Nightingale, some best-selling book that they were going to star in together the first time being in a movie as adults that Melanie Laurent was directing as a big Columbia Pictures production that got halted during the pandemic. I think they maybe filmed a week. It got shut down. It has never resumed filming. Weird. Isn't it? Huh. It okay. was like a big announced thing of like, we bought this best-selling book, we're reteaming them out. Melly Roth's quietly been making very good films in France as a director. This was sort of her step up. And then the movies just, they keep delaying it. All right. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, sorry, I'll turn the lights back on. I know that was oh, kind of weird. Ow. Yeah, we did that way too long in the dark. To be fair, we couldn't afford to keep the mics on in, in light. So we had to, it was a production workaround. And that's... No citations on Wikipedia yeah, for citation that. citation needed for yep. that, for that yep. uh, fact. Zach, you're the best in the biz. Thank Thanks. you for watching Rollerball. Oh, I was uh, I was happy to. I was thrilled. Did okay, you... Good. Did you... Uh, no, you watched on Tubi, you said. I was yeah. going to ask if you bought I a digital copy. I watched it on Tubi, and uh, honestly, the jarring commercial interruptions I was so somewhat jarring. worked for the themes I, of the, of I the could film. See that. I could see the, the naked commercialism yeah. of Tubi just yeah. like in the middle of someone saying a line yeah. being like, erectile dysfunction! Yes. Like, oh, yes. Okay, sure. Yes. Yeah, here, here we go again. It, it, Tubi also does the thing where they're like, there's no ads for 45 minutes. And then there's eight ads for the next 45 you minutes. No, you can't get a rhythm. You can't <laughs> right. figure out like, how. Yeah. Yeah. They're also, there's no one like trying to design ad breaks deliberately. No, they're just like, yeah, just pick a number. It'll happen in the middle of a line. Yes. In the 100%. middle of a word. Brief to be aside. Please. Uh, for Christmas, my wife got me a poster of 100 like essential horror films. It's a scratch off poster. Humble cool. Right. It's amazing. One of the best gifts I've ever received. That is, We've been going back. Person. So wonderful. you scratch it off and then you watch it? You, you watch it, then scratch it off because often oh. there's like a reveal that you wouldn't get until you've seen the movie. They're crossing off the list and they're giving you a tidbit you wouldn't. Yes. Now that you've, you're you right. on the other side, you can so learn. It might be like the twist is revealed behind the scratch off, whatever. Right. But we've been going back from the beginning chronologically okay. and watching like, uh, what is it? Dr. Doctor uh, Testament of Doctor Mbo? No, like Doctor Something's Cabinet of. It's like considered Dr. the first. Caligari. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Cabinet yeah. Doctor Ca Caligari. Yeah. Uh, it's like considered the first horror movie. Sure. Yeah. So we've been watching all these 1920s silent movies, but on Tubi. And oh. if you if you want jarring, <laughs> you go from Doctor Caligari straight Oregon to music. Yeah. Straight to like a man and woman being like, we don't have enough money for groceries. <laughs> 
and just like slapping stuff on the table. Are you depressed? Like it's uh, amazing. That amazing. is that have is you, really funny. Have you had have you watched stuff online that is interrupted by your own ad breaks? Because uh, you had no. a robust commercial campaign where you were popping up regularly I mean, on show. I, I was getting fed your ad a lot. I watched like the U.S. Open, okay. you know, so but not like in a to be style. <laughs> I was getting it. I was definitely getting it online because like I don't have cable. I don't watch anything on broadcast anymore. And I, I definitely remember watching shit online having interrupted by you saying I'm a very big deal. <laughs> the U.S. Open, yes, but yeah. but that was like you know linear TV. Okay. If I watch Bosch Legacy on Freebie, mm -hmm, I've yeah. never watched a Freebie show. That yeah. one, I have to have, watch ads, right? Yeah. Like, there's no way to pay yeah. your right. way listen, out of the ads. Freebie is Amazon's ad-supported streaming service. Unlike Amazon Prime Video, a <laughs> streaming service that they've now decided to <laughs> add ads, ads to. Yeah. But um, it at least, they, they know they, it's, Right. They're yeah. actually placed with right. some... Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. It's designed with, with intent, with purpose. Right. Right, right. Uh, Zach, you're the best. Best in the biz. Best in the biz. Uh, Ever watch Severance whenever that happens? You're so yeah, fucking please. good in You Hurt My Feelings. Oh, thanks. You are so good in You Hurt My Feelings. So thank you, fucking thank good. You. I mean, was that fun to make? Yeah, it was great. Super fun. I, I, I love her movie, yes, so it's yeah, like too. super psyched to get to do that. You know, I'm always a fan of everything you do. I think you always kill it, but that role is just like you really, just straight three pointers. You really hurt <laughs> you. Tobias Mendes. Yeah, yeah. You, do, you, yeah. Really do. <laughs> you really do. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug? I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, yeah, when's what else when's uh, uh, baking show coming back? Uh, baking show, the celebrity holiday uh, special. The second one of that is already out on Roku channel. Who are the celebrity contestants? Um, there's a bunch. Okay. Um, and I could list them off the top of my head, but I'm not allowed. I'm, okay. I'm too young to... It um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> looks like uh, DeAndre Jordan yep. was part of it. Yep. Uh, NBA center, DeAndre mm -hmm. Jordan. Champion, uh, I only follow champion. Rollerball. I don't know other Ego athletes. Wadim from... Uh, the Great. Saturday Ego Night Live. Uh, Phoebe Robinson. Uh, Joel McHale. The Great. The great. Uh, it's a fun bunch. Arturo yeah, it Castro. Was yeah. It was a lot of fun. And then the like main season, I think, will be out uh, sometime in I don't know. Sometime. Casey Wilson this season. Yes, Casey Wilson is co-hosting this season. Uh, so you were you were filming while we were doing George Lucas stuff in Edinburgh, so we got to hang out, which yeah, was really nice. That was fun. You, was you fun. stopped, you uh, cr jumped across the pond. Yeah, hopped on the old choo choo and uh, made my way up to Edinburgh. It was great, Edinburgh, yeah. Edinburgh. We'll have you on again soon, Zach. For yep. the, the next time we find a movie whose trailer led to a yes, lawsuit, there must be trailer-based litigation. Yeah, maybe that. Uh, what was that movie Zach Galifianakis was in right after The Hangover? Lumineers or something? Or no, not Lumineers. Visioneers. Visioneers, where he was like in the trailer a lot. Yeah, right. that was his like only. Yeah. So I'll sue someone about that, and then we can talk about that. Right. Right. You Perfect. sue the hell out of what poor indie filmmaker yeah. to yeah. slap that movie together. You need to make I'll your next there, episode right. happen by starting your yeah. own lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy um, to do it. Thank you. You're the best. Uh, and 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 you know who else is the best? Our listeners. I would never say an untoward word about them. We love them unabashedly, and they've never driven us crazy. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Murray Barty, our associate producer on the show, uh, AJ McKeon, production coordinator, Alex Barron for our editing, Lane Montgomery in the Great American Novel for our theme song, Joe Bowen, Pat Reynolds for our artwork, JJ Birch for our research. As we said, more uh, McTiernan uh, uh, crime uh, info coming next week on Basic, but also if you go to blankcheckpod.com, links to some real nerdy shit including our Patreon Blank Check special features where we're doing commentaries on the Terminator franchise, but also doing a full episode on Pelicano. Yeah, special episode on Sin Eater, the Sin documentary Eater. about this. The crimes of Anthony Pelicano. Yeah, that'll be posting. Oh, you know what? That's already posted. Okay, well, then... It just posted. Look, go week. listen to that. Yep. Tune next week for Basic. Yep. The yep. finale. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Travolta and um, uh, Jackson together again. Travolta and Jackson together again. No other things to say about it. And as always, Chris Klein should have gotten a Best Supporting Actor nomination for his role as Oz in American Pie. He's good in it! <laughs>